Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Foxy ICOG certification course on emergency obstetrics, which has been a great success on the first two days. And today is the concluding day of ICOG webinar with Foxy, which has got about 10 talks by stalwarts on various topics covering emergency medicine. And uh, for this series, I thank our uh, president, Dr. Parvi Kotitawala, uh, ICOG chair, uh, ICOG chair-elect, Dr. Parag Beniwale, uh, series convener, Dr. Parag, and uh, Dr. Sneha, madam. Series convener, all... Dr. Charmila. Char Dr. Charmila. And um, uh, the coordinator, I, Dr. I no. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Sneha, ma'am. And all dignitaries present here. And... Uh, uh, I think now uh, Charmila ma'am will take it from here. No, no, you have to hand over it to me, introduce me and hand over it to me. Yes, Don't so, waste time in introduction. Yeah, That's yeah. Me. Dr. Dr. Sneha ma'am, we know that she is a very, very active governing council member of ICOG, a very senior practicing obstetrician gynecologist from Maharashtra. And she has held several key posts in AMOX, awarded several uh, uh, key awards awards during her tenure and her large uh, practice uh, duration of more than three decades. Uh, she is the, uh, you know, she has got this show together, which has seen an overwhelming attendance of more than 1600 delegates on day one and day two. So without wasting any more time, mm -hmm. I'm very thankful to ma'am for giving this opportunity to coordinate today's webinar. And I would like madam to begin Thank today. You. Thank you so much, Monica. First of all, a very good afternoon to one and all. Uh, specially respected Foxy President Dr. Jaydeep Chank and Madam Madhuri Patel, the Secretary General, uh, my mentor here, Dr. P.K. Shah, sir, of course, the ICOG Chairperson Dr. Parul Kotradawala and uh, Secretary Dr. Sarita Bhalle Rao, uh, ICOG Chairperson elect Dr. Parag Biniwale and uh, Vice Chair Madam uh, Sheila Mani, the entire uh, team of Foxy ICOG office bearers, of course, uh, a very good afternoon and a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank all of you. And of course, let us have God's blessings. And may I have the invocation video first, Nirima, to start with. Thank you so much with the God's blessings and blessings of the seniors. I welcome all of you <clears throat> once again, and I hand over uh, the forum to Madam Sheila Mane first. Uh, just I welcome the guests for today's program, Dr. Sheila Mane, Dr. Parag Bilivane, Dr. Ashwat Kumar, as well Dr. Ajay Mane. So I hand over to you, Madam, for your welcome address for today's program. Dr. Sheila Mane. Yeah. Uh... Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thank you, uh, for Dr. Sneha Boya, uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity. And I think it's my proud privilege, and that too, I feel very proud today as a vice chair of ICOG that uh, this excellent program, third day, is going on so well with such a such a good attendance. And I think uh, that itself shows the interest that uh, how the emergency obstetrics is so important. And I think uh, in these three days. Uh, the program is so well structured that uh, try to cover almost uh, topics related to that. And uh, I would like to uh, thank Dr. P.K. Shah, Dr. Ambuja and all the seniors, uh, today's faculty for accepting the invitation to be here with us today. And uh, that shows that everybody is so keen to teach everybody and uh, the delegates are also so eager to learn from them. And uh, I think uh, all of us, we know today's program, two days, it was mainly related to 
maternal health, but now intrapartum and uh, the different presentations, the fetal distress and all other problems which are faced during intrapartum. And for this, you again require uh, the, uh, I mean, the documentation and the medical legal part comes in none other than then Dr. M.C. Patel is also there with us today to talk about that. And uh, uh, the great faculty to today, I think uh, there are senior persons uh, like uh, Dr. Uh, Harish Doshi, our office bearers like Parik Shittank and uh, Dr. Pikesha, I already told the one of the past president is here, which is so nice. Dr. J.B. Sharma, Dr. Niranjan Chauhan, Dr. Char Mila, uh, Dr. Vaishali Nayak uh, from uh, Pune, as well as uh, Dr. Jayashri Srinivasan. And uh, I think I must I have taken almost everybody's name. So the, the faculty is also great. So I welcome all of you. And I would also like to welcome today's chief guest, that is Dr. Parag, who is our uh, uh, chairperson elect. Dr. Ashwat Kumar, who is so closely associated with ICOG and doing excellent academics, and our vice president, Dr. Ajay Mane, a very cheerful person who is also here today as the guest today for our third day program. So on behalf of the today's program coordinator, Dr. Sneha Bhuyar and her team and ICOG, I welcome all of you and welcome all the delegates and real thank you to all the delegates for taking such a great interest to make this program so successful. So I welcome you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam. And Madam has already welcomed everybody. I would just request a guest uh, for today's program, Dr. Parag Biniwale, uh, to say a few words. Thank you, Sneha. Uh, it's inappropriate to call me guest because uh, the Chairman of ICOG, Dr. Parul, has given me and Dr. Sheila Mane the responsibility of being series convener, right? So uh, I, it's it's always a pleasure to be sitting in the ICOG programs because it's a great learning experience. And when we have seniors uh, like Dr. Pikesha, Dr. Ambuja, and so many others who are going to uh, teach us obstetrics today, I think it is going to be a treat for all our uh, delegates. So thank you very much. Uh, Parul, thank you and the entire team for having yes. me here and my best wishes for the program. Thank you, Parag. And may I invite uh, Dr. Ashwat uh, for his few words uh, for today's program, if he's there. Uh, by the time we can have Dr. Ajay Mane, our Vice President of Foxy. Precious words from you, Ajay. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, <clears throat> Sneha, madam, for uh, calling me, respected Jaydeep sir, Madhuri madam, uh, Parul bhai, and uh, Sarita, ma'am, uh, who is uh, the chief of our academic wing, basically. Uh, Fox is also academic wing, but they are more academic. They are 100% academic, <laughs> ICOG. Our uh, president, uh, chairman, rather, Parag Bhai, uh, Sheila, madam, uh, who is a PPH lady, Charmila, my co-chair, uh, vice chair, uh, then uh, coordinators, Monika ji, Supriya ji, and Monika ji, uh, Umbardhan, rather. And uh, all the faculties, respected P.K. Shahasar is there smiling uh, in her moustaches. Uh, sorry, her moustaches. And uh, I, I, uh, I think uh, this is the third time this week I am uh, uh, seeing P.K. Shahasar. I am amazed that how the enthusiasm is uh, there with the P.K. Shahasar. And he is growing younger and younger. Parag, you have competition with P.K. Shahasar. Ki. <laughs> and uh, today's topics. Best topics because emergency obstetrics all must know how to deal with our emergencies, drills and drills and the protocols. These are the two words you must remember in your life. For whole life, you can be uh, allegations. So uh, learn good today, give the test, pass it. And ICOG is a world recognized branch uh -huh. of Foxy. The certificate is very precious. Get the certificate and you will be approved uh, every day. So, thank you very much. Best thank luck. You. And thank you, Sneha. Thank you, Shilaman, thank you for, Dr. Ajay Mane, for your precious words. And I just convey that Dr. Aswath is on a family holidays with, uh, I mean, and difficult to reach uh, because of the network issues. I thank all of you. And I just present the yesterday's uh, recap in short. Um, Dr. Because, Sneha. Yes, yes. Sir, just thank a you. word. <laughs> yes, yes. Please. Ajay, you were talking about the mustache of Pikesha turned upwards. You can also emulate him. Yours is turning downwards. Okay. 
and I am here more as a ceremonial presence because Nilima insisted me that sir be there for a few yes. minutes. We, but we please go ahead pressure. with the program. And in fact, uh, just to save the time, uh, we did yes, not yes. ask you for your words, sir. Thank you <laughs> no, so no, much. No. Thank you. Uh, in fact, thank you so much for because of your uh, you know support we could uh, go ahead with this program i had asked for the uh, program in june but sir has uh, insisted that i should do in uh, march itself and uh, believe me within two weeks time we have formulated the entire program communicated with all of you and the program is here so once again i just thank all of you and i just present yesterday's recap in short and we go ahead with the pretest soon uh, so yesterday we had a very good uh, registration also 640 and uh, of course a very good number online all the time so thanks to all the speakers uh, Dr. Sarita Palerao, she spoke on abruptio placenti and, you know, unanticipated emergency in many a times, though it can be predicted in uh, hypertensive disorders, of course. Uh, vaginal bleeding may or may not be there, may be disproportionate uh, maternal to the maternal vital signs. She may have severe pain in abdomen, fetal distress or death, coagulopathy may be the features. Diagnosis can be <clears throat> made early with high index of suspicion and management with prompt intervention and correction of coagulopathy. The messages are very clear by Dr. Basab Mukherjee, who spoke on placenta previa, a wonderful talk with valuable take-home messages. And uh, placenta previa uh, warrants close follow-up right from its uh, diagnosis during the antenatal period. Uh, along with the target scan, we must look specially for the placenta localization and the RP lake or the sonolution zone. That is the message. The patient and her relatives should be taken into confidence, explained about the catastrophe in spite of all our precautions and utmost care. Uh, we have to keep the blood ready and, you know, uh, the decision making should be informed. Uh, we have to anticipate uh, PPH as well and warn about the risk of future pregnancy. Uh, Dr. Ratna Seri from Sri Lanka delivered an important talk on present accreta uh, spectrum and the same thing again that we have to uh, go for localization as well as the look for the presence or absence of the RP zone. Uh, the expert sonologists with good resolution sonography definitely can diagnose the placenta previa accreta, but in obese women or maybe the posterior placenta, uh, we may need uh, MRI to confirm the diagnosis. Uh, again, the same thing, continuation of pregnancy, but the elective obstetric hysterectomy and with a team of senior obstetricians, senior anesthetists, expert neonatologists with uh, NICU, intensivist, and the surgeon or oncosurgeon, neurosurgeon, interventional radiologist, and of course, blood and blood, uh, blood bank for the products, uh, blood components, I would say. Uh, everything has to be ready. Dr. Punam Shukumar, who spoke on sickle cell crisis, which is, you know, this disease is very rampant in Vidarbha, the region I belong to. And um, we do face such kinds of uh, sickle cell crisis during pregnancy. So uh, hepatitis B vaccination, maintaining good hydration and oxygen, uh, oxygenation, avoiding crowd, close spaces, uh, high altitude, all these things has to be followed. Hydroxyurea may help, but cannot is contraindicated during pregnancy. Aspirin, low molecular weight heparin, analgesics, antibiotic prophylaxis, all this should be given. And of course, testing of the fetus by Korean Miller's biopsy, if both the parents are you know, trait because the baby will be SS disease. Uh, Professor Dr. Aruna Suman, she delivered an extensive talk on non-hemorrhagic shock, very well covered in short time. Uh, Professor Do Vidya Thopi delivered an important talk on anaphylactic drug reactions during pregnancy. The, because, because of this anaphylactic reaction, maternal hypotension and hypoxia, it will be detrimental to the both mother as well as fetus. So the emergency management is very, very necessary. In fact, prevention plays a major role, avoiding the triggers to these anaphylactic reactions in the form of avoiding those drugs and foods, and of course, preparedness, as all of you know, the emergency trolley, but some bands and patches having the safety measures, you know, containing epinephrine, uh, auto injectors have uh, are available. That is a good message from her side. Dr. Alpka Pandey delivered extensively on major and minor blood reactions and how to tackle it. She also discussed on taco and trolley. 
डॉक्टर रितु जोशी द क्रिटिकल केयर एक्सपर्ट फ्रॉम फोर्टेज जयपुर डिस्कस एक्सटेंसिवली ऑन द डीआईसी थ्रोम्बोइलास्टोग्राफी फॉर अर्ली डायग्नोसिस एंड एक्जैक्टली व्हिच ब्लड कंपोनेंट एंड हाउ मच मैडम जयम कानन डिलीवर्ड ए एक्सेलेंट डेलिब्रेशन ऑन एम्नियोटिक फ्लूइड एम्बोलिज्म हाउ कैटास्ट्रोफिक इट कैन बी सो अर्ली डायग्नोसिस एंड प्रॉम्प्ट एंड इफेक्टिव केयर इन द ऑब्सेटिक एचडी और आईसीयू is a need of the, the hour of course the multidisciplinary team and dr atul ganatra who is a uh, critical care expert from fortis mumbai delivered an informative elaborate talk on the jaundice during pregnancy he covered almost all types of hepatitis a b c e and of course hemolytic jaundice uh, the acute fatty liver of pregnancy thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura hemolytic uremic syndrome help and of course certain types of hemoglobinopathies uh, which we have to tackle during pregnancy so i thank all the expert uh, sp speakers for yesterday and uh, i thank all the chair persons also uh, so with this uh, uh, i we go ahead with the today's pre test uh and uh, without wasting much uh, time i declare that the inauguration is done and we go ahead with the pre test nilima can we have the link for I that yes i thank all of you once again
Yes, the time is up. And uh, yes, uh, Nilima, you can close the link also. And uh, I thank all of you once again. And with, quickly we go uh, ahead with the uh, academic session. And for this, I hand over uh, the forum to Dr. Monica Singh from Bhopal, uh, a coordinator for our, our course. Over to you, Dr. Monica. Good evening, ma'am. So uh, we proceed with our session one, for which we have five lectures, and I invite the chairs. Our first chairperson is respected Dr. Priyanka Roy, who is a very well-known figure in the horizon of Foxy in India. He's not only the India representative to wet dog, FIGO, but he's also the national chairperson of perinatology, uh, national coordinator of perinatology committee of Foxy, and the E-Zone Coordinator of Infertility and Endocrinology Committee, FOXI, and the Chairperson of the Public Awareness Committee of FOXI. He's also a very dear friend. Ma'am, will do, ma'am. Thank you so much. And go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome, Dr. Priyankur. Next, I invite our Chairperson, Dr. Sushila Ma'am, who is Medical Director and Consultant at Manjushri Specialty Hospital, Bangalore, and the past President of Bangalore Obscani Chapter and Society of IMS, past Chairperson of BSOG PG Forum, and the winner, the winner of Vidya Bhaseen Award, Best Teacher Award. Welcome, Madam. I invite for chairing these sessions, Dr. Kiran Pandey. Uh, Madam is uh, from Kanpur, and we all know her as a very accomplished uh, senior medical teacher and academician. She has been chairperson of the medical education, she's the chairperson of the Medical Education Committee of Foxy, Professor ex HOD Department of OBGY GSVM Medical College, Kanpur, and ICOG mm -hmm. Governing Council member. Madam Thank is a senior reviewer of Jogi. Welcome, Kiran, ma'am. Very nice Thank to you. Be again. Next, I invite to chair our session Dr. Sita Bhaskar Palma, who is consultant fetal medicine and obstetrics at Apollo Multi Specialty, Kolkata. And she is chairperson of Fetal Genetics Committee of Foxy, a uh, very active in Bengal of Chinese Society, Society of Fetal Medicine, and a very big conference on genetics uh, in April. Congratulations, conference, uh, best wishes for the conference, and thank you for being here, Sita Ma'am. Uh, I also invite to chair Dr. Nilesh Palkavde, sir who is a very dynamic uh, uh, chairperson of the quiz committee of Foxy. So he will keep us all on our toes with his questions. He is a <laughs> senior uh, obstetrician gynecologist, endoscopist, very active in MSR and MOX, and we are delighted to have him today. So uh, over to chairpersons to start the session with speaker one. Priyankur, would you like to introduce the first speaker, please? Yeah, ma'am. Uh, of course. Our first speaker is Dr. Charmila. Yeah. Dr. So Charmila. Thank you so much, uh, ma'am, and thank you for giving me this opportunity in this excellent ICOG course. A uh, number of participants speak for the uh, for the uh, for the success of the course already. So I would like to introduce Dr. Charmila, ma'am. Uh, she is. Uh, uh, a very, very uh, thorough academician. She is currently the vice president of Foxy, has held many, many posts in Foxy and also a governing council member in uh, ICOG. Ma'am is an excellent speaker and I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from her. I welcome thank you, ma'am. Over to you for your session. Thank you so much, Priyankur. I'd like to thank uh, Sneha for the opportunity. And she gave me a very, very difficult topic. Uh, doing vaginal uh, breach delivery through a presentation is difficult. It needs a video presentation, but doing it in a 15-minute slot is a little difficult. I'll try to do justice for it. Thank you so much, Snega. And we have to remember that breach occurs almost in 3 to 4% of term deliveries. And term breach always will have a worse outcome compared to a cephalic presenting baby, irrespective of the mode of delivery. It can be a vaginal or a cesarean birth. It will have a worse outcome. The incidence of planned vaginal breach birth in the world drastically reduced after publication of the term breach trial. And the ter term breach trial was published 20 years back and it brought down a reduction in the general birth, a breach birth in the, throughout the world. And that has led to a lack of experience to a loss of skills essential for these deliveries. And we have to remember that doing cesarean for all our breach deliveries can also have serious long-term consequences for the mother and the baby. And that's why these skills have to come back again into the clinical picture. But we need to know the contraindications to a general breach, breach delivery. A cord presentation is a contraindication, a hyperextended neck cone ultrasound, a high estimated fetal weight, uh, more than 3.8 kg is what uh, the NICE guidelines say, but the term breach trial took 4 kg as the cutoff. 
small babies, growth restricted babies less than the 10th centile as a contraindication for vaginal birth, footling presentation, evidence of antenatal fetal compromise in the baby. And the term breach trial also took the upset in fetal anomalies and an existing indication for cesarean birth as an indication for repeat cesarean birth. And please do not uh, do a cesarean for a babe, mother who is in active lab, labor with a breech presentation. And always use an intrapartum ultrasound, even if you have not done before, to identify the fetal neck, arms, and weight of the baby. And don't do bre general breech delivery under spinal anesthesia. That is, you're you actually waiting for a catastrophe to happen. And don't do cesareans with breech on the perineum. That is also going to cause problems anytime. And induction is not contraindicated according to the Canadian guidelines, even though the other guidelines are a little skeptical about induction in a breech birth. And according to most of the guidelines, augmentation should be avoided because an adequate progress is the best evidence for an adequate fetopelvic proportion. But our, however, if epidural analgesia has been used for the mother and the contraction frequency is low, augmentation can be done. And notably, most of the experienced advocates of vaginal breech birth do not support labor augmentation saying that it will actually add on to the problems. And the requisites for a vaginal breech birth is the case selection, the skill of the operator, and the intrapartum management. And there are two very important elements in a vaginal breech birth, and that is usage of continuous fetal heart monitoring and non-interference in the delivery of the baby until the spontaneous delivery of the breech till the umbilicus is visible. And we, need, we know that the engagement of the breech happens when the bitrochantric diameter of the fetus crosses the pelvic inlet. And when you do a PV examination, it will be palpated at minus two to minus four station. And when the breach reaches the levator ani, there will be an internal rotation. And the fetal sacrum is the point of designation for a breach birth. And this fetal sacrum will move to the transverse pelvic diameter when it crosses the levator ani. And then once it crosses the, uh, the levator ani, then the bitrochantrium diameter will move to the AP diameter. At the outlet, the breech will crown, it will emerge as a sacrum transverse and then rotate to sacrum anterior. And crowning of the breech will occur when the bitrochantric diameter passes under the pubic symphysis. And that is what we call as a climbing of the breech. Crowns and then climbs, and the posterior buttock is delivered first and then the anterior buttock delivers. And what will you happen if you rush for the delivery of the trunk of the baby? You will go on to cause a cervical retraction and that will cause an after coming head entrapment. There will be a deflection of head if there's a rushing of the delivery of the trunk before it delivers by itself. And that will add on to the non-descent of the uh, further breach. And the larger occipital frontal diameter of the baby will be presenting at the outlet. And that will cause difficulty for the after coming head. And sometimes when you rush for a delivery of the trunk, the arms can be caught at the neck of the fetus and those called the nuchal arms. And sometimes one or both arms can be trapped behind the head above the pelvic inlet and the baby will not deliver. So the anticipated problems in a breach, a vaginal breach, which is an emergency condition is, suppose it's a frank breach, you will have difficulty in the legs delivery. You may need to use a pinards maneuver. There may be a difficulty in the delivery of the trunk. Then you may need to do a rotational movement at the fetal pelvis with external rotation of the thighs, and that will cause delivery of the trunk. And suppose you have a nuchal arm condition, you need to go for the lawsuits maneuver. And for after coming head, if there's difficulty and there's no spontaneous delivery, you may need to go for the MS3 maneuver or the Piper's forceps, whichever you're comfortable with. What is a Pinard's maneuver? It usually happens, it's needed for a frank breach where the fetal thighs are flexed against the fetal abdomen. And after the umbilicus is visible, the Pinard maneuver may be needed to deliver the legs. Here, you will apply pressure to the uh, medial aspect of the knee and that will cause flexion and subsequent delivery of the lower leg like this. And this is called as the Pinard's maneuver. The delivery of the trunk can be helped by rotation of the, at the pelvis. So the fetal pelvis is held and a counterclockwise direction is made and the fetal right thigh is first externally rotated. Then a clockwise rotation is done and the left thigh is externally rotated. And when both the thighs are externally rotated, it will help with the delivery of the trunk. And after the uh, rotation of the, of the thigh at the hip, there will be flexion of the knee and delivery of one leg at a time will occur. And this is how the delivery of the trunk happens. Uh, it will come in a flex position. The rotational movements can be done and the baby can be delivered in such a way that the, uh, it can be uh, moved to either way and the fetal thighs are externally rotated and the baby is, uh, baby is delivered. What is the Lausitz maneuver? Suppose the scapula is visible and the arms do not deliver spontaneously. 
just applying a gentle pressure, the anticubital fossa of the baby will cause the arm to reflex and deliver. But suppose the scapula is not seen, that means it's nuchal placement of arms and that then you need to go for the Lausitz maneuver. In the Lausitz maneuver, the baby is turned 90 degrees into transverse and the provider will reach over the baby's shoulder, will slip the finger down to the brachial plexus, sweep the arm in down in front of the baby's body. And that is the Lausitz maneuver for a nuchal arm. Delivery of the head can be usually spontaneous or flexion has been maintained by you without any rushing for the delivery of the trunk of the baby. So it will be spontaneous. The chin and the face will appear at the outlet. I can deliver them quite uh, comfortably. But if the delivery does not happen, please go on to the Marius smell, smelly weird maneuver, which is much better than the Marshall Burns. But in the MSV maneuver, you will apply pressure on the maxilla and not on the mandible. And you can do a gentle downward traction along with suprapubic pressure. And this is how the MSV technique is done, where you'll apply pressure over the baby's maxilla, flex the baby's head, and then deliver the baby with gentle traction, downward traction. It should be very, very gentle traction there. Suppose you're comfortable, you can go on for the piper's forceps. Here, one thing is very, very important that fetal trunk should not be extensively elevated by the assistant. There should be a very, very slight elevation as it's done here. And the operator should kneel and apply the forceps. It should not be applied by standing. The operator should kneel on the ground and then apply the forceps. A special labor cord is needed for this delivery. And just dropping the foot of the head in a bed as in any other delivery of uh, a vaginal birth is inadequate for a piper's forceps application. And remember that piper's forceps does not have a pelvic curvature. And epidural analgesia can actually cause problems in vaginal birth uh, breach delivery because it will increase the risk of cesarean because you need the mother to bear down in a breach delivery for an effective delivery of the baby. And an epidural may interfere with this. Uh, mo most of the people who advocate a vaginal breach delivery usually say a continuous support is much better than uh, epidural analgesia. And the other thing which is very important is electronic fetal monitoring, which will give excellent results in a planned vaginal breech birth because you need to know whether the baby is becoming hypoxic. And breech presentation is usually associated with an increased risk of cord prolapse. And during delivery, when the cord compression happens as the head enters the pelvis, this will be better tolerated by a fetus that is already not hypoxic. And that's why growth restricted babies should not be allowed for vaginal breech delivery. And we have to remember that a good fetal tone on the baby will also enable an easier breech birth, which is more unlikely with if there's a non-hypoxic fetus. And if the electronic fetal monitoring is abnormal before the active second stage, an emergency cesarean is much better than prolonging for a vaginal birth. So what are the problems you should anticipate in a breech delivery? There may be a chance of cord compression always, and that's why you need to avoid ARM. Where a quick ARM is never done in a breech birth. It has to be a spontaneous rupture. And if a slow progress is documented, it's better and safer that you go for a cesarean rather than persisting with a vaginal breech birth. And suppose you've given epidural analgesia and there's a slow progress, oxytocin augmentation can be done. And the passive second stage should be allowed to go on its own time. You should not rush a second stage just because the cervix is fully dilated. Allow the breech to actually, actually uh, uh, deliver by itself. And you can wait for actually two hours in passive second stage. And only when the breach is crowning, you should encourage maternal peer pushing and never before that. Then suppose you've allowed almost two hours of passive second stage and the breach is still not visible at the perineum, it's better to go for a cesarean section. And the precautions which are taken is you can use either a semi-recommend position for the mother or an all fours position if you're comfortable with delivering in that position. Maternal pushing should be encouraged only after the breach is visible at the introitus. Active management of the umbilicus uh, uh, should be done if the umbilicus, uh, the baby is believed up to the umbilicus. If there's a poor tone in the baby, suppose there are extended arms or there's an extended neck, do not do tactile stimulation of the fetus often because that will cause a reflex extension of the arms or the head and that should be minimized. And the baby should be always grasped around the pelvic girdle and not around soft tissues and the neck should never be hyperextended. And uh, RCOG advocates a selective episiotomy rather than a routine episiotomy. And indications for assistance during a breech delivery is a lack of tone in the baby, a lack of color, delay in the delivery of the birth, or there are extended arms, extended neck. If there's an evidence of poor fetal condition, it's better that you go for an assistance for delivering. And if there's a delay of more than five minutes from delivery of the buttex to the head, or there's a delay of more than three minutes from the umbilicus to the head, then assistance should be given. The timelines given by the American colleges. Suppose a, a mother presents in labor with breach uh, in active second stage and an uh, ultrasound is unavailable, 
should go for a cesarean section. They say without an intrapartum ultrasound, it is not right that we go for a uh, vaginal birth of a breech delivery. And you can allow a passive second stage of one and a half hours according to our ACOG, whereas RCOG advocates almost two hours of waiting before active pushing is acceptable. But once active pushing is commenced, the delivery should be accomplished within the next one hour. Otherwise, cesarean section is recommended, but that will be a very, very difficult cesarean section. So the techniques of assisted breech delivery to summarize will be, if the back starts to rotate posterior, posteriorly, please do a gentle rotation without traction and always make sure that the back remains anterior. And once the scapula is visible, the arms can be hooked down by inserting a finger in the elbow and flexing the arms ac across the chest. Or unluckily, if the arms have become nuchal, the loss its maneuver is advised. Delivery of the head should be achieved either with the MSV maneuver or with pipers for zips, not with martial burns. Suprapubic pressure will aid flexion of the delay due to an extended neck. Delivery using the burns martial technique is not advised at this point of time due to concern of overextension of the fetal neck. There's one other method which has been advocated for the head delivery, and that is the Brach's maneuver. Here, after spontaneous delivery up to the level of the umbilicus and the arms are already delivered, the baby is grasped, grasped in both hands, keeping the legs flexed against the baby's abdomen and without any traction is brought up against the symphysis pubis. And that should be accompanied with suprapubic pressure. It is different from martial burns, where in martial burns, the baby's head will be taken up uh, by traction and then taken over the mother's abdomen. But here, it will be once the uh, arms are delivered, the baby is then taken in the uh, uh, taken over the mother's abdomen. In the preterm birth, uh, routine episiotomy is avoided. And when there's a head entrapment in a preterm breach, incisions on the cervix are advised. And that can be done with or without tocalizers. And the RCOG advised uh, incisions at the 2, 6, and 10 o'clock positions to deliver a entrapped preterm breech head. And in a twin delivery, a plant cesarean section where the presenting twin is breech is recommended. But do not do a routine emergency cesarean section for a breech which is present, who's a presenting in a spontaneous labor. And the, you can actually individualize the mode of delivery depending on the gestational age and the other conditions in the twin. A uh, routine cesarean section for breach or the second twin is also not advocated in either term or preterm. You can't deliver a breach uh, of the uh, second twin. So the techniques to maximize power is the main thing in a breach delivery. It is not the pulling. It's not traction. It is a maximizing the power in the mother. And that is an effective maternal effect effort which should be encouraged to push correctly. Hands and knees posture will, will help. A Brach's maneuver may help you to deliver a after him coming head. And oxytocin augmentation and epidural is advocated. And uh, fetal head delivery is the one which usually we face difficulties. Usually it will deliver spontaneously. They have been very calm during the delivery. Suprapubic pressure will aid in the fetal head delivery. The MSV technique will help or the usage of hyperforceps. If there's an uncorrectable breach which you're not able to deliver, the obstetrical team should have a plan of action for the rare trapped after coming head or irreducible nuchal arms. Then you may need to do a symphysiotomy or a zevenal maneuver which can be life-saving to the mother. So these are the references. I'd like to thank ICOG team and Dr. Sneha for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you for the wonderful talk, ma'am. It was very enlightening as always. Uh, uh, you very well mentioned about the four limb position as well, which is getting a little popular nowadays as well. And thank you for that. And I think the key message from this, the take home message I would say from this whole talk was be gentle and do not hurry. I think that is the main message that we need to take and do it under monitoring, that especially under ultrasound monitoring and fetal monitoring. Thank you so much, ma'am, once again. Thank you, Priya. Thank you. Thank you for the great talk, uh, Dr. Charmila, ma'am. And uh, we have the next speaker, Dr. none other than Dr. P.K. Shah. And I invite Chairperson to introduce Dr. Shah, please. Hi. I think Dr. Sushila, ma'am, is she there? She plays. Dr. Kiran Pandey, ma'am, can you please do the honors? Dr. Kiran Pandey, ma'am, you have to unmute. Hello, please. hello, hello, hello. Yes, yes, definitely. Uh, thank you. Uh, it will be my honor to introduce Dr. P.K. Shah. May, can I have uh, his CV? We all know Dr. Yeah, just P. one line. Just okay, one sir. line. Okay, sir. Yes, yeah. please spare time Dr. for sir. Dr. Shah has been a, a past president of Foxy and is oh. a master on ultrasound. We do remember always uh, him, his uh, capabilities and his tricks and tips on the ultrasound. And uh, recently, I've seen his interest is on the iron anemia also, which is the 
anemia mukt bharat program he is giving lots of talks about it so dr p k shah i am sure uh, you will be delivering this talk also very nicely so yeah. please floor is yours can i share my screen yes sir please yes sir dilima yes, you have met sir yeah already yes slide show Uh, uh, so at the bottom there is a small uh, yeah, icon for slide yeah, because of our videos photographs i can't see it okay sir then on the right side upper side mein slide ka option hai abhi Uh, sir at the top line also next to animation transition there is slide show written slide show option yes on the top where files home insert drawer is written sir yeah, can i can change it sir this is my top why make it full uh sir upar mein slide show ka option hai ha bas एनिमेशन के बाद जस्ट अबाउट जस्ट अबाउट टेक यू एरो टू लिटिल अप दैट कप यू कैन सी दैट आइकन लिटिल अब हो सर एट द टॉप टॉप मोस्ट चेंज कर हां आई कांट सी एनी हाउ यू कैन सी इट यस यस वी कैन सी सर आई थिंक यू कैन स्टार्ट लाइक दिस आल्सो गो आइडिया या थैंक यू Foxy office bearers, ICOG office bearers, past, present, and future, and uh, Charmila and Sneha for giving fantastic topics for last two days and even today, and picking up very good speakers. So, without much of ado, I think I'll start with shoulder dystocia, unpredictable and unpreventable, and uh, we all know that. it's very difficult because many times it comes to you as a sudden surprise so i'll cover it by telling you the definition incidence consequences risk factors and management <clears throat> so what is the definition the head to body delivery time more than 60 seconds and head to impaction of shoulder especially the anterior shoulder against the symphysis pubis as given by williams obstetrics <laughs> normally mean time of normal delivery from head to shoulder is around 24 seconds and when it is more than 79 seconds you call it as dystocia the difficulty encountered in delivery of the fetal shoulders after delivery of the head due to impaction of the fetal shoulder behind the symphysis pubis incidence is around 0.15% to 2% sorry and as the weight of the baby keeps increasing it keeps increasing like it's 0.2% if the weight of the baby is 2.5 to 4 kg it's 1.7% if it is 4 to 4.5 kg and it becomes almost 10% if the weight of the baby is more than 4.5 kg there is something called as a bilateral shoulder dystocia which is usually not seen when even the posterior shoulder has not entered the hollow of the pelvis and this presentation often requires skip pelvic representation uh, replacement and c section we all know about this unilateral dystocia it will easily dealt with by standard techniques now how to recognize shoulder dystocia there is something called as a turtle sign whereby you have appearance of the head and then retracting back of the head in the birth canal delivery of head with arrest of shoulder delivery with usual delivery maneuvers like axial traction on the fetal head etc fail what are the risk factors remember many cases of shoulder dystocia occur with no readily identified risk factors like antepartum factors maternal obesity diabetes mellitus postpartum pregnancy excessive weight gain previous shoulder dystocia short stature multiparity abnormal pelvic anatomy 
and intrapartum factors include prolonged second stage of labor oxytocin induction, meat forces, vacuum extraction, etc. Fetal macrosomia and maternal diabetes are most strongly associated with shoulder dystocia. No single risk factor or combination of risk factors are predictive for which infants will experience shoulder dystocia. We all know about various complications. The fetal complications include fractures of humerus, clavicle, herbs, palsy, perinatal asphyxia, which is uncommon, brachial plexus injury, 4 to 16 percent, and very rarely you can have even neonatal death. The brachial plexus injury occurs due to downward traction on the neck while trying to pull the baby's head down. Most important fetal effect, most common cause of litigation in shoulder dystocia and independent of operator experience, good news is 80% of these cases have complete resolution within 6 to 13 months. And maternal complications include postmortem hemorrhage, laceration, cervical, vaginal, and puerperal infection. What is the impact? PPH can occur in almost 11% of patients due to atomy and soft tissue trauma, third, fourth degree perineal tear, puerperal infection, sympathesis, diathesis, very rarely, and even uterine rupture you can have in some of these cases. Now, can it be prevented? <clears throat> the answer is no. But there is a room for prediction and anticipation. So prevention of shoulder dystocia, Prevention of shoulder dystocia with C-section prior to labor should only be considered in unusual circumstances like estimated fetal weight in diabetic of more than 4.25 kg, estimated fetal weight in non-diabetic more than 5 kg, and issue of prior shoulder dystocia with various injuries to the fetus. 50%, more than 50% of shoulder dystocia Cases occur with average weight of the baby is less than 4 kg. So always be ready as it is most of the time unpredictable and unpreventable. <clears throat> Once it is recognized, do not ask the patient to push, do not apply fundal pressure, and do not panic. Management of shoulder dystocia includes individuals who must be present in the room, labor room, if shoulder dystocia is anticipated or encountered. This includes the attending physician or obstetrician, anesthesiologist, pediatrician, nursing staff, and extra hands. Avoid four Ps, panic, pulling of the head, pushing on the fundus, and pivoting the head. <laughs> Sorry. There are three, there are few grades like mild, if you have a mild grade of shoulder dystocia, you can use Mac Roberts maneuver or only suprapubic pressure. Moderate, you can have Rubin's two woods or reverse woods maneuver, posterior shoulder delivery. And if you have a severe grade, you can go for fracture of the clavicle or humerus. And if it is undeliverable, replace the kephalic, uh, the head and do C-section. There are various maneuvers I think we all know. Like Matt Roberts' maneuver, suprapubic pressure, Gaskin's maneuver, episodomy, Wood's maneuver, Rubin's maneuver, delivery of posterior shoulder, Zavanelli's maneuver, symphysiotomy, etc., etc. But what is more important is helper, H E L P E R R. H for call for help, E for evaluate for episodomy, legs, you utilize Matt Roberts' maneuver. External pressure on the suprapubic region, enter rotational maneuvers, remove the posterior arm, and roll the patient onto her four, uh, on, onto her hands and knees. And there is something called as an alarm, which almost includes the same thing. Each step should not take more than 30 to 60 seconds, and totally you should be able to deliver the shoulders within five minutes of time. No indication that any of these maneuvers is superior. They represent a valuable tool to help clinicians take effective steps to relieve impacted shoulder. So H is call for help. See that you have 
shoulder dystrophy are drilled in the labor wards and documentation. Evaluate for episiotomy, not necessary for all the cases, but it should be done obviously before delivery. So for legs, you have to use the Mac Roberts maneuver, which is safe, simple, and effective. And if used alone, it resolves 40% of shoulder dystrophia. What you do is place the back on a flat surface, lift the knees to the chest, and that is very simple, Mac Roberts position, and evaluate for an episiotomy. So this is how you can see the initial position. And then once you do this, elevate the knees toward the chest of the mother, and this is how Mac Roberts position can be achieved. What happens? You straighten the sacrum. It moves the symphysis pubis towards the maternal head and frees the impacted shoulder. Suprapubic pressure, P for suprapubic pressure, determine the position of the fetal back. Initially, give continuous suprapubic pressure and then it's just like in CPR, rocking motion. You can give suprapubic pressure. This is how you have to give suprapubic pressure when somebody else is trying to deliver. Then E is for enter into internal maneuvers, and that includes Wood's screw maneuver and Rubin's maneuver. What is Wood's corkscrew maneuver? Wood's corkscrew maneuver is the shoulders must be rotated, utilizing pressure on the scapula and clavicle. Please do not try to rotate the head. It has to be the shoulder by putting hands on the fingers on the scapula and the clavicle. This is how you will carry out Wood's corkscrew maneuver, not by putting your hand on the head, but on the shoulder. Rotate the posterior shoulder almost 180 degrees. If it is the entry shoulder, you push it from behind. If it is the posterior shoulder, push it from front. Rubin's method is rocking the fetal shoulder from side to side, and this may allow the shoulder to deliver. Reverse wood screw, posterior shoulder from behind you should use if the initial procedure fails. Then comes the next thing, and that is R, remove the posterior arm. How do you do it? This is how you will do it. To bring the fetal wrist within the reach, ex exert pressure with the index finger at the endocubital junction and deliver the posterior arm. And then it will make it easy for you to deliver the anterior shoulder also. Roll the patient. This is something just now Dr. Chamila told you. They put the patient on all four limbs like this. Okay? Gaskin's maneuver it is called. She is on four limbs and try and deliver. This makes it very easy. Why? Because it might be disorienting for unfamiliar doctors. So a senior person has to be there. It increases the obstetric conjugate by almost 1.5 centimeters in this position. And that allows you to deliver the entire shoulder. Whether it is gravity or the movement itself, patient delivers baby very easily. The same maneuver can be applied. And there is something called as the Mazentis technique, whereby you push, not only you give suprapubic pressure, but you are giving pressure and rotating the anterior shoulder so that it comes into the oblique diameter of the pelvis when it is in the anteroposterior diameter. And that gives it a bigger diameter to be delivered. Now, all fails. You tried all these things, but you can't deliver. So what is the last resort? Deliberately, you can do fracture of the clavicle. There is something called as a Zavanelli's maneuver whereby you give tocolysis, replace the head, and do C-section, symphysiotomy. There is always a risk of urinary tract and symphysis and uh, spinal injuries. Then you can have a cleidotomy with a dead fetus, obviously, abdominal surgery, plus hysterotomy. 
you have to keep all these case reports for various maneuvers that you use in this patient. How do you do cleidotomy? The anterior clavicle is pressed against the ramus pubis. Care should be taken to avoid puncturing the lung by angling the fracture anteriorly. Theoretically, a fracture of the clavicle is less serious than a brachial nerve injury <laughs> and often helps heal and it often heals very rapidly. I don't know how many of you ever tried symphysiotomy, should know about it. Once in lifetime, it may be needed. Actually, it is very, very, very simple by cutting with a knife the symphysis pubis. Zawa Nelly's maneuver, first described in 1988, consists of kephalic replacement and then C-section. Mixed reviews are there in the literature for this particular maneuver. Can C-section for suspected macrosomia reduce the rates of shoulder dystocia? The answer is no. <clears throat> Sensitivity of clinical estimates of birth weight, more than 4.5 kg is only 20%. Ultrasound is not very accurate at extremes of estimated fetal weight. Most cases of shoulder dystocia occur in infants of average weight. Incidence of birth trauma in larger infants is not trivial. Almost 2.5% with birth weight, more than 4.5 kg. So what are the take home messages? Shoulder dystocia is unpredictable and most of them occur in patients with no risk factors. So always be ready and calm while dealing with shoulder dystocia. Know your H-E-L-P-E-R-R, helper. Permanent fetal injury may be prevented by limiting non-axial traction on the fetal head. Mock drill in labor rooms proved to be helpful in a need of action. Documentation and debriefing after shoulder dystocia is essential part of good patient care. Thank you very much, ladies and gent gentlemen, for patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. P.K. Shah, sir. It was a very crisp and still all in giving the complete information about the shoulder dystocia. But I think, friends, and sir, I would say it's uh, once it happens, of course, the incident is less. It is really uh, very, very important, as you said, to remain calm because that is what is the thing which everyone becomes panicky. So there it becomes the role of seniors and the guidance from uh, people like you, which can, I mean, we can keep in mind that this is what was told and we have to keep quiet, we have to keep calm and we have to get that helpers. The mnemonics were beautiful. So with that, yeah. with the help of that, definitely we can uh, manage the complications. So, although once in a while, sometimes problems do happen and the infant the mortality and the severe morbidity of the infant can occur so the prediction is part is also very very important and evaluation thank you sir for a very informative lecture thank you very much thank you ma'am our next talk is by dr veshali kode and to chair her talk i invite chairperson dr sushila Pinamaneni, ma'am. Ma'am, can you introduce our speaker, please? So the next, the next topic. Hello. Yes, Dr. Sushila, you are audible. You can go ahead with the introduction yeah. of the uh, speaker and invite yeah. the speaker. The next, yeah. Uh, next talk is by Dr. Vaishali Nayak. Uh, she is the HOD and a professor at the Mimar Hospital, Pune, and also she's a consultant uh, uh, fetal medicine specialist at uh, Singapore, and also she is a critical care specialist at uh, uh, Ruby Hall. Madam is also the examiner for uh, UGs, PGs, and also the Royal College, and mm -hmm. also a very active uh, uh, committee member of uh, Violence Against Women, Foxy. Okay. So Thank over you, to you, ma'am. Over yeah. to you, ma'am. She's going to talk on face presentation during labor. Over to Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind introduction, madam. Uh, respected uh, office bearers of Foxy and ICOG, I would like to thank you all for giving this opportunity to me. Uh, Sneha, ma'am, may I share my screen now? Yes, yes. Yes, Vaishali, please go ahead. Yeah. 
so thank you so much to Par parul kat kodada wala sir bhalirao madam sneha madam parag bini wale sir and dr sheila mani and all the chairpersons and my dear friends i'm going to talk on face presentation during labor i hope i'm ready to go yes yes you are yes. seen and uh, audible as well yes so the learning objectives of today's talk is the student should be able to define what is the face presentation they should enlist the types of face presentations the etiology why face presentation occurs clinical diagnosis mechanism of labor and the management and knowing the complications of this presentation we know these main complications or mal presentations which we deal with day to day out of which occipital posterior and face has a coordination and we will come to it how so when it is cephalic presentation that is the lower pole of the uterus is occupied by the fetal head but the head is completely extended and the presentation is face we call it as face presentation the incidence is almost 1 in 500 in cephalic it is a rare thing but we obviously need to know that how to deal with it so when in cephalic presentation there is complete flexion we get vortex when there is a little bit of moderate flexion like less flexion than usual we get deflexed position where op position is very common if there is little further deflexion leading to mild extension we have brow presentation and mind well we don't have any mechanism of labor in brow and when the head is completely extended almost the the posterior part of the head touching the back so this full extension leads to face presentation the diameters involved as you all know you have been seen so in face presentation when there is complete extension the diameter is submento brigmatic which is 9.5 cm so we are very much familiar with the 9.5 cm diameter and we always feel comfortable when these lesser diameters come in role because the chances of delivering them vaginally increase there is complete extension submento brigmatic is the diameter and mentum is the denominator so this is how the baby looks in uterus when it is face presentation the diameter we have seen there is complete extension of the neck and the rest of the limb and the body are in flexion there are two types of faces commonly seen that is mento anterior and mento posterior so if we see these positions and mento anterior and mento posterior and to complete the list we also have mento lateral position so total 6 are mentioned out of which the left mento anterior is very common and the reason why it is very common is because as i told you it is related with the op position so right occipito posterior position is quite common because the other oblique diameter is occupied with the sigmoid colon thus making rop quite common and in rop if there is extension of the head than flexion it leads to left mento anterior position making it almost 75% time the position in case of face presentation so rop is anyways five times more common than lop that is left occipito posterior position so conversion of right occipito posterior position to face makes it left mento anterior which is the commonest how the characteristics of face is the face fetal head and the neck are hyper extended the occiput is almost touching the upper back of the fetus the presenting part of the fetus is complete face the attitude of the fetus shows flexion at the limbs but extension at the spine and the denominator is mentum the causes the maternal causes which leads to face presentation especially when there is pendulous abdomen less stone muscles seen in multi paras if there is a flat pelvis it favors face if there is deflection from brow so initially it was either op position or brow and in labor the head gets deflexed that also leads to face presentation 
and any fibroid or other tumors in pelvis as well as the low lying placenta also favors face presentation. Fetal causes, anencephaly, or even dead and premature fetus can be in face seen in face presentation. But the other causes, which I always tell my students to remember, wherever there is flexion of the head is not possible because of some obst some uh, thing obstructing it, like loops of cord around the neck or the tumor of the fetal neck, maybe congenital goiter, or if the extensor muscles are hypertonic, or there is dolicocephaly, where the, the fulcrum is misplaced. In such cases, the flexion will not be possible, and these fetal causes will favor face presentation. So when we examine on abdominal examination, we always feel a groove, a groove between the back and the occiput. And on vaginal examination, we see the face or we feel, not see, but we feel the, our fingers will feel the face. We will feel the nose or even the finger can go inside the mouth and the malar prominences would be felt. So we recognize it on per abdomen examination where we feel this groove, the limbs felt either side of the midline, fetal heart usually are heard on opposite side of the back and on per vaginal examination, the face, face is felt. We tend to mistake a uh, breach because uh, the if the patient is not known to you, she's a report or coming in late first stage or early second stage, that time there would be edema, the soft tissue uh, would be difficult to make out, the liquor would be drained. In such cases, we may have to rule out that it's not breach and that time the relation of malar processes with the mouth, that is a triangle formation, help us. So in face, we will feel the nose, The if we put the finger in the mouth, the sucking effect Malar prominences would be felt, the chin would be felt, and occasionally we will feel supraorbital ridges, but it will be difficult. They are more prominently felt in brow presentation. So this is what we are going to feel on PV examination. And we have to understand the triangular relationship of these two bone, the bony prominences and the mouth. In case of breach, it would be in one line two ischial tuberosities and the anus would be in the center. So they would form a line, not the triangle, which is seen in face presentation. Here, if you put the finger inside the mouth, there will be suckling and the glowed finger will never have meconium. In case of breach, you will have meconium if the finger is put in the anus and no suckling would be felt. So this is how we need to differentiate it from breach. If we have labor room has nearby sonography, then it is always better to rule out any congenital anomaly in the fetus, as well as to know the expected birth weight of the fetus to make a decision depending on the face presentation and its position. We have to rule out that it is not brow. This is very important message that brow has no mechanism of labor. There is mento vertical diameter, which is the engaging diameter in brow, which is 14 centimeters. And the inlet of the pelvis or any part of the pelvis cannot deliver 14 centimeter diameter. So we have to rule out that it is not brow what we are dealing with and it is face. So in brow, we will feel the supraorbital regis and mainly the anterior fontanel. This anterior fontanel will not be felt in face presentation. And the treatment for brow is caesarean section, whereas in face presentation, we can deliver them vaginally. We are coming to it. So the types of face presentation, it can be primary face like through antenatal, it, which is very less commonly seen, but it may happen that it is occurring since pregnancy. And mainly it is because of the fetal causes where the flexion of the fetal neck is not possible. And secondary phase presentation is when it, either it is cephalic and then getting extended or brow and OP getting extended during labor and maybe because of maternal causes. So how do we manage them? We have to assess the clinical assessment of the pelvis, the correct position. We have to have a large bore IV line because this labor is going to take longer time. 
necessary investigation, cross-matching have to be done. Patients should be counseled that what kind of labor we are going to have. And we have to replace fluids in this woman because she would be kept NBM with uh, to avoid dehydration and ketosis. And partograph would be of help if we are crossing our alert lines. Continuous fetal monitoring is also important. Adequate analgesia will always make our patient comfortable. And we have to have continuous and regular observation of maternal and fetal condition and labor progress. We have to be ready for operative intervention, either vaginally or abdominally when we are managing pace. We have seen this, that what exactly is the situation. So what is the mechanism? What happens? We all know the cardinal stages of labor that there is engagement, descent and flexion are continuous. But here in phase, rather than extension, we have extension going on continuously as the head descends. Then there would be internal rotation, delivery of head with flexion, contrary to the normal delivery with extension. Then there would be restitution and external rotation would be seen because of internal rotation of the shoulders and rest of the body would deliver with lateral flexion. So when considering mento anterior, when the mentum is, mentum is facing the iliopectineal ligament, the glabella is at the sacroiliac joint. The engaging diameter is submentobregmatic, that is 9.5 centimeter. The descent takes place and the mentum touches the pelvic floor, the levatorani. And as the denominator stretches the levatorani, whenever the contraction passes off, the denominator gets, gets shifted towards the pubic symphysis. So there would be an internal rotation of the mentum through one eighth of the circle and the mentum will lie below the pubic symphysis. The neck will sustain this torsion of one eighth of the torsion, so the shoulders will not move. Gradually, crowning will take place, and but it will take time. And uh, then the head will be born with the movement of flexion. So the mentum will hinge below the pubic symphysis, and gradually there would be delivery of mouth, nose, forehead, sensiput, vertex, and occiput will sweep the perineum. Then there would be restitution, which will be in the opposite direction of internal rotation through one eighth of the circle. And then shoulder will touch the pelvic floor and there would be internal rotation of the shoulder, which will be seen as external rotation of the head and the baby's face would look at the maternal thigh. The anterior shoulder will escape the pubic symphysis and rest of the body will deliver with lateral flexion. So this is the mechanism of labor. Let's see how do we manage it. As we have seen that rare, rarely we know that it is phase presentation during antenatal checkup, but in case we have diagnosed it, then we need to discuss the mode of delivery with the couple. We need to tell them that it may be a prolonged labor, it will be operative delivery if done vaginally. So the chances of cesarean, operative delivery, the morbidities involved, everything we need to discuss. In case of any suspected CPD or confirmed CPD, or if there is low-lying placenta, if the baby size is relatively big, previous LSES, then we have to go for LSES as treatment of choice in phase presentation. And during LSES, we need to be very careful while taking the incision because exactly below our incision is the face of the baby. So we have to be careful. And we need to deliver this fetal head during cesarean section with gentle flexion because our head is very well extended and that will prevent nerve, nerve damage when we deliver the baby this way and it will also make the delivery easier. In case the baby is average size and with our counseling the couple decides or opts for vaginal delivery then a liberal episiotomy is a must and we have to be ready for forceps if needed. Ventus is definitely contraindicated in phase presentation. Spontaneous labor is always better. We have to again confirm when the lady is in labor that the pelvis is roomy at all three levels, inlet, mid pelvis, and the outlet. Bag of the membrane will always help, help uh, us to have the progress of the labor. So no haste. If in case of PROM, we need to rule out cord prolapse, there would be delayed engagement and a prolonged labor. We all have to be ready for that. 
Now let's look at mento anterior. If we are delivering them, uh, delivering her vaginally, then in first stage, wait and watch policy to so don't do anything with test. And we conduct the labor uh, as we conduct in OP position. It there would be delivery. The the only difference is as the face is going to stretch this perineum, we have to give reverse perineal support and wait uh, and give liberal episiotomy, which is mandatory. In case of mento posterior, LSES is the treatment of choice, even in case of a full term IUD. But there are mechanisms available in case it is preterm delivery, small baby. There can be, there is a hope that long anterior rotation through 3 8 of the circle can take place like OP, but there is a chance that it can be only short anterior rotation leading to yeah, mental yeah, lateral yeah, position yeah. and it can also be mal rotation. Time is up. Yes. Mentos. Time is up. Yeah. Okay. I'm almost done. So uh, these are the complications which we see in face. And the fetus would have edema and marked molding. So this is how the fetus looks. So all these care we need to take and the prognosis would be good if we consider this care during phase presentation delivery. Thank you. Thank you, Vishali ma'am. And for the next talk, I would invite our speaker, Dr. Harish Doshi. And to chair the session, I invite Dr. Nilesh Balkawde. Thank you so much, Dr. Sushila. Dr. Sushila is a professor at Vijayawada and a past president of Vijayawada Society. Is Dr. Nilesh around? Uh, I think, uh, Monica, you can ask the next person to introduce. Yes, now it is done. Yeah. So, yeah, welcome, sir. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, madam. So, Dr. Sita, you can uh, introduce Dr. Yeah. And we got this yeah. Good evening, everyone, and thank you. Uh, congratulations, and thank you, Dr. Sina, for this wonderful series that uh, uh, of emergency obstetrics. So uh, we have with us Dr. Harish Toshi and it is my proud privilege and uh, honor to introduce him. He has been the professor of FAD at GCS Medical College Ahmedabad, Gujarat, a very passionate and very uh, you know, sought after teacher, had multiple publications and chapters to his credit and welcome you sir to talk on your topic of, uh, thank you so much. Can I start so exciting? Yes, sir. Okay. So uh, you have to tell me whether it is coming full screen or? It's not shared as it. Not yet, sir. No. Not yet, sir. Yeah. Now? Yes. Should I? Now, yes, but it is full, full, screen. full screen? No. no. Please make it slideshow. Okay. Slideshow. That comes. Uh, uh -huh. Yes, sir. Make it full yeah. screen, too. Right side okay. at the bottom of yeah, the exactly. screen. I mean, that is the, uh, I think. Okay. Now, now it is okay? Not Madam? Yet, sir, but... Not yet. So I should take a new share, resume no, share no, or no. new share? Because it is always happening like this. New resume share. share. Okay. Uh, can I screen wala kar do, screen wala. Now, just check. Yeah, now? Perfect, perfect, sir. You can go. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, I must thank top Foxy office bearers and ICOG office bearers. And now the convener, Dr. Sneha, madam, and all coordinators, Dr. Monica and Dr. Monica and Dr. Supriya and Nilesh. Right. All all good faculties, all good friends, right? I am given the topic deep transverse arrest. Okay. Fine. So oxyposia, as we all know, occurs in 10 to 15 percent of all cases at the beginning of labor. And from under your days, we know that 90 percent rotate to anterior. But 10 percent will get arrested. And in that right side 
posterior or transverse is five times more common than left side left side because of sigmoid colon on left side right which is right not allowing the problem is it is difficult to diagnose before late second stage of labor that which 10% will not rotate and will get arrested so there the main problem our problem starts so uh, arrest can be of three types deep transverse arrest oblique arrest occipital sacral arrest but dta is the commonest dta is the commonest transverse arrest is the commonest usually it is a secondary arrest primary it is very rare usually it develops during labor with little anterior rotation because of mild deflection okay the criteria well known for deep transverse arrest second stage of labor it has to be such as during transverse position maybe that 5 degree here or there one hour previously it was given half an hour still some authority said for multi parallel half an hour for primary gravida one hour station zero or below maybe plus one good uterine contraction normally we don't wait for this all criteria to fulfill and we jump or enter in the treatment which is mostly cesarean section right we take this is early but if you can wait you may get the result of vaginal delivery what are the labor characteristics of right occipital posterior slow progress delayed dilatation of cervix in coordinate uterine action it already labor patient gets fed up you are also tired you age progress nahi hota hai right something is not right doing well more backache as compared to other patient premature bearing down edema of anterior cervical ring because now everything is transmitted posteriorly so anterior cervical ring gets less right effect and gets obstructed and edema develops and naturally early rupture of membranes which leads to excessive caput now this is something new not new but nowadays last 10 years and rcg also told that for any problem in labor intrapartum labor room if, and now with nmc it is must to have sonography machine in labor room in private also it is possible so ultrasonography during labor helps in case of doubt of diagnosis of occipital posterior if you have doubt if you have no doubt it's okay but you can do sonography in first and second stage of labor when you manage this case it as far as the any occipital posterior labor analgesia epidural is the best it takes care of backache in coordinate uterine contraction decreases manipulation m and lscs also may be required can be done under same anesthesia and pain relief allows to bear for a prolonged labor patient can wait because there is no pain otherwise with pain they are tired theoretical advantage of relaxing the pelvic floor leading to persistence of occipital posterior is not found or proved by evidence although it may be there but it is not evidence does not support it now this is important these two centers do not diagnose deep transverse arrest before second stage of labor and also before one hour in second stage of labor then only you stamp it as a dta if arrest of labor occurs in a late first stage of labor it is not a dta it is non progressive first stage of labor and it is due to other causes uh, right and uh, then arrested occipital posterior some heads rotate very late and sometimes at the outlet and not at the pelvic floor particularly flat pelvis right so if a fetal heart sound is good and descent is happening may, may not be rotation but descent is happening in a good size pelvic platypelvic pelvis or flat pelvis one can wait for vaginal delivery to occur it is not dta then when there is a descent if pelvis is good in such case oxytocin should be used it increases the uterine activity causes corrects the deflection which is the main cause and drives the head firmly against the pelvic floor which right then causes internal rotation to complete now why there is a problem in dta because of failure of internal rotation it may be to abnormal pelvis anthropoid and android pelvis maybe large head weak uterine action either to start with because the deflex head does not fit it properly and fetal axis pressure and uterine axis pressure of contraction is not coinciding wastage of force so it is a cause and effect both related deflection of the deflection as i told you is not a good stimulator and larger diameter it presents so rotation may be hampered poor pelvic floor originally poor multi parasitic patient 
or rarely, as I told you, it is not proved, epidural analgesia. Early rupture of membranes, like a drained out and the baby cannot rotate, which has to rotate 90, at least 90 degrees for 135 rotation of the head. So these all lead to deep transverse arrest. Now, out of this, you can't correct abnormal pelvis. You can't correct large head. You can't correct, you can't go reverse to rupture of membrane. So what you can do is take care of EQ transaction, deflection of the head by doing PV, flex on the anterior frontal side, so that can right help you and poor pelvic floor again no much right remedy. So management of the process arrest I bold in an underlined and a big font size. Then comes ventus. Then all these things: manual rotation, full end method, half end method, two fingers or digital rotation, forcep rotation, pilan forcep. I was doing now my. Uh, assistant professors and faculties are not allowing me to do. They don't call me. They do cesarean section. But still, if a case is there, I can do. And I have done many 18 kilan forceps. And if the baby is dead, craniotomy, this is there. So when do it? Less traumatic than forceps because it does not occupy the space in the pelvis, lateral wall of the pelvis. Right? It is in the head, as we know. Rotation occurs spontaneously. Any object can rotate around its central axis. So, you have to just give traction. Rotation occurs automatically. You spool in plus one station. Don't try vacuum in a zero or higher station, but plus one station, it is more likely to success. And in absence of large caput, if caput, it does not stick properly. Pelvis should be normal. Failure rate more if proper application is not achieved. Manual rotation. Uh, we have been taught and we were, right, uh, still it is going on, but nobody does it now. Full end method, half end method, because you require general anesthesia, first disinfect the head, then flex the head, rotate with occipital anterior, right, making the anterior with rotation of the shoulders per, or body per abdomen, fetal trunk. Apply one billet of forceps before removing the hand. So it is manual rotation, GA, and then forceps. Nothing of that we are doing now. So, right, in full hand matter, use right hand uh, for ROP and uh, left hand for ROP, but four fingers, half hand matter, you can use on only on dominant hand. That is a usually right-handed person we are, so you can use right hand or any dominant hand. If you are left-handed, you have to do that. So, but this manual rotation is not done. What is done now is digital rotation, two-finger rotation. It is oblique or transverse, right Okay, with two fingers, without GA, in between paints, you can take the pivotal support of the whatever molding has occurred, take your fingers there and push the head, right, occiput anteriorly, right. And there is a paper, use of spatula for rotation is also reported, spatula, with spatula you can rotate, but full hand method, half hand method, that rotation is gone. So this how you can do that, make it rotate and goes anteriorly. And then you can do uh, either forceps or that. Rotational forceps are not right done for deep transverse arrest. Any arrested oxyproposition in modern oxygen due to lack of skill and experience. If the time permit, I'll uh, show you the small video. Temptation to apply routine forceps because now I, can, I am uh, doing all low forceps or mid forceps, right? Or, I mean, outlet forceps. So I use this forceps, it is head is very low. No, it should be avoided. If there is no rotation, blade will not lock. You will not be able to deliver. Vacuum is in this case better. If I think, if I can, right, make the video run, right. I'm, I'm sorry, this is. Can you see the video? Hello. Yes, yes, definitely. Yes. So no, the no, first, no. it is a right occipital transfer, right? Anterior blade, Kilan has two blades, anterior and posterior, not right and left, right? Then first the anterior blade is introduced. Posteriorly, there is artery forcep for when bleeder bleeding was there. Already I've given the episiotomy, right? Okay, now, right, I'm introducing the second blade. This I've introduced by direct method, right? This is direct method. Second blade, posterior blade, it is introduced directly posteriorly. Right, as like any other, right, and then you write, right, right, this sliding lock, you have to adjust that, sliding lock, right, not an English type of lock like other forcep, right, okay, now I'm, I'm just checking and then locking and then 
right? During relaxation phase, I may rotate. I'm, I'm slightly rotating, slightly rotating, now rotating, rotating. Again, wait. If contraction comes, you can wait because that contraction has not caused rotation in as the first place. That's why you have to use instrumental delivery, right? Because pain was there. I was waiting. Now I am rotating, 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 rotating. Now it becomes right and left blade. After rotation is complete, it is now not anterior and posterior. It is right and left blade, right and right. I Next pain, I will deliver. Right, next pain, I will deliver. So this is Kilan Forsep. As I told you, now my ass assistant juniors don't allow me to do it. Miss, they don't call me for deep transfer. They deliver by scissor section. And I am at home. Right. So this is very right. See, the great Ian Donald has said, give me the pair of Wrigley's for SEP and Kilan for SEP. In anywhere in all, the whole world, I can do my complete obstetric career. So baby is well. I should stop that video. All right. Okay. Uh, now I'm going for again. Uh, I think this is not a uh, share screen. No, it is okay. Can I continue with this? Slide show is not there. I, I, I think I should make yeah, slides. Click, click on the screen. Okay. Now, now it is okay? Yes. yes. Rotational forceps are not done, uh, right? As I told you, vacuum is better. Kilan forcep. the recent study, my uh, colleague are from Mumbai and other people, right? Matter and neonatal complication following Kilan forcep delivery, a systematic review and meta analysis, Brit British Journal of Australia, 2023, last year. Conclusion, Kilan's rotation forcep right, is a safe option for the management of fetal malposition in the second stage of labor, but definitely requires skill, and I have not done less than 20, but very good result, I must tell you. Now, cesarean section for deep transatlantic. The head is deep in the pelvis, so you have to do push method, or, right, push from below, normally we use full hand, or up. you have to introduce more depth in that, or you require more strength, it is jammed, so you require more strength also. Anticipate and be ready after anesthesia and push the head before putting incision. This is important, right? Don't try the first, I will try to deliver the head if there is a difficulty. Then I will ask somebody to push. No, be prepared, right? No, nothing harm. If you believe in this push method, you can do that only. But, right, uh, that scission section, I am telling you the problem. Uh, if one is not trained and confident in instrumental labor, scission is a better option. But there are risk in tears due to difficulty in delivering deeply engaged head, leading to postpartum hemorrhage. The other method, pull method, right? Modified Patwardhan method, right? Patwardhan suggested it for occipital anterior, and then this is occipital posterior or transverse. Uterine incision should be deliberately kept higher level. Pass the head high up in the uterus, reach up the fundus. Then only you will catch the limb, lower limb, because you have to catch the leg. Hands come very easily. Hands are very freely mobile. As we know, our legs and hands. So, hand automatically comes in your hand. Don't do that. Go, go, go to the fundus and catch the leaf. It is called, also called reverse breach extraction. Now, we are doing scissor and spinal anesthesia. So, if there is a contraction, wait for 30 seconds. Otherwise, you will find it very difficult. When I teach my students this modified patwardhan, they find, sir, it is very difficult. Because they try it under contraction. No, you wait for contraction to go and then try it. It is very rewarding and not difficult at all. EBM supports full method. There are other devices, right? There are other devices. There are other devices. They fit on below. Silicon balloon device and with saline you can push and inflate. It pushes the head through 3 centimeter above. And then you can deliver by scissor section. There is a Tideman tube. That semi-rigid silicon tube, in studies, it is found more effective than fetal pillow or your routine push method. These two things are there. This is tube, silicon tube. But you can use your normal vacuum for pushing. With hands, it is okay. Infection and all this, you have to push. Uh, you use your simple vacuum cup, detach it from the other tube, other part of the machine, and then just push it. It helps. It is a push method. You go on the more on the uh, anterior portal side, flex, it flexes the head. And I, I've done this and very, very easy to use vacuum for this purpose. If the fetus is already dead, craniotomy is better option than scissor section. Catch scalp with two long alice possible, cut with scissors, easy to perforate through suture line, right? 
we were taught that we have to perforate two bones suture line and overlap but that no problem that brain matter immediately comes out and if you have problem you can use the suction cannula and then brain matter you can flush it out right dead fetus head low down in pelvis you can do it under simple pudent block also even not spinal right. right so that is there okay so right so deep transverse key points deep transverse is the commonest type of arrested occipital posterior vacuum delivery requires less skill and experience cesarean section is the best option due to lack of experience and skill in the right instrumental delivery be prepared for difficulties at cesarean section reverse speech extraction right is the right preferred method thank you very much Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for that wonderful talk. It was a pleasure listening to you and watching that video, rare video of the feelings which we rarely get to see nowadays. Writing the method courses, it's a diagnosis of second stage and be very careful about uh, how you assess it. And if you are doing any procedures, I think it's better to take to the theater and then be prepared for an emergency cesarean if required. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, Dr. Harish Doshi, for that enlightening talk. And uh, with the uh, permission of Dr. Sneha, madam, can I move to session two now? Or do we have some time for... No, uh, no. Immediately we have to go. Right. Dr. Ambujam, what you have not finished yet. I am waiting, Sneha. Dr. Ambujam, talk is there on intrapartum. Yes, yes. Uh, Monica will invite you. Yeah. We can go ahead with the second. Yes, Dr. Ambuja. Hey, yes. Monica. Sorry. Is here too. This is the last talk of session one. I'm yes. sorry. Yeah. I thought this was session two, your talk. Ma'am, session one, the last talk is by Dr. C. Ambuja. Ma yes, ma'am. And to share this uh, session, uh, I would like to again invite uh, uh, Dr. Nilesh can introduce her. Elish, Dr. Elish. Yes, yes. He's the... Elish, Elish was Elish. Elish. Yeah. I can see him. Okay, you can... You, you told you my name. Interest. Sita, you can do that. Anybody can. Because yeah. we don't know. Okay. Um, thank you and welcome, Dr. Rambuja. I think we've, uh, we've seen the... Um, hello? Yes. She's been the visiting professor, uh, retired professor in HOD Osmana Medical College. She has been the research committee chairperson and the president, past president of Indian Menopause Society. And after hearing all these various things, a very important thing that we need to assess the fetus all the time is to monitor these fetus. And Madam is going to talk about intrapartum fetal monitoring and distress. Thank you, Madam. Over to you. Good evening, everybody. And uh, I especially thank Aisuji uh, team. And uh, for giving me this opportunity, and Sneha especially, for uh, it's such a wonderful topic. And as you said, uh, Sita, until now, all the experts, they spoke about the delivered and delivered successfully, breach, phase, transverse life, what not, everything. And uh, Dr. Harish uh, did a wonderful uh, forceps delivery uh, key lands which we have seen. All these things, goal of all of us is only to see that mother and baby tolerate the uh, labor. So, but we, we know that fetal response, how it is going to be is always a, a challenge for all of us. And then certain fetal heart changes so our aim is to see that fetus will not get anoxic or see the certain fetal changes will take place before actual brain damage takes place. At that point, we have to catch the fetus and act accordingly. Labor is the most dangerous journey in man's life. And we want, all of us want a healthy baby and healthy child. And fetal anoxia, because of that, infants that die are damaged due to birth asphyxia. There should be a quality improvement everywhere in every country. And like each baby counts, this is the RCH quality improvement program that is there. These are all the things I am going to touch up this one. I am not going into details. 
coming to the definition of what is hindra part of fetal distress this is a very important thing that point of intrapartum period is so important that's why we made that one to one facing uh, is going to give a good uh, result so a fetus encountering acute hypoxia during labor leading to asphyxia and acidosis is the intrapartum fetal distress but you know there is no uh, proper definition either for asphyxia or for the distress fetal asphyxia in labor causes this much only we know that brain injury and stillbirth and hypoxic uh, encephalopathy disabilities in survivors. Most healthcare providers have replaced the term fetal distress with a non-reassuring fetal status. That's what we are calling. Uh, see, this is such a serious matter. One increases the perinatal mortality and morbidity. And WHO has said this type of fetal anaxia is 100% preventable and with one-to-one -one delivery, if it is possible. But in India, only 40% of the deliveries are under supervision of the healthcare providers. And India being the, uh, this, this article is produced, it's a review article in IJOG 2011, where maximum number of deliveries take place in India only. And perinatal mortality, it is quoted by WHO, is 56107. Of course, in Kerala, it is still in single numbers, it is there, like UK. But intrapartum asphyxia producing the uh, CP is 2 per 1,000 live births. Whatever is done, not much of improvement in the recent years. There is traumatic brain injuries leading to the cause of morbidity, mortality, disability, all these things are there how best we can deal with it. We know two things that are there during labor. One is uterine contractions. With each uterine contraction, the oxygen uh, flow comes down and anoxia will be there. And the, how the response of the fetus will be present. Whether it is a tolerated oxygenated baby or not oxygenated baby, whether it will tolerate the insult or not, that's what is very, very important to me. Hypoxic baby, it can be acute hypoxia or chronic hypoxia. But chronic hypoxia, 90% of the times it is the uh, during pregnancy only and not because during the labor. So admission test is the best to see whether this baby will tolerate hypoxia or not. What is this admission test? It is a dynamic screening test for the state of oxygenation of the fetus on admission. This is to detect high-risk fetus to anoxia in low-risk mother. This is what is very important. Mother is okay. We consider it as a low-risk. Only when we subject her for the uh, screening test, this is for the CTC, uh, we will know whether it is can tolerate the pregnancy or not. And pathogenesis, all of us know it is only because of the anoxia. What happens? It's cerebral um, baroreceptors and uh, when um, a stimulation which leads to fetal heart first it will increase and then it will come down and more than that what happens relaxation of the sphincters will take place leading to the meconium that is in the amniotic fluid and meconium aspiration syndrome can occur this is you know acidosis metabolic acidosis is the main problem normally if oxygen is present Glycolysis and pyruvate will come, but if there is no oxygen, it is the lactic acid accumulation which leads to the acidosis. All of us know the causes of uh, fetal distress. I am not going maternal factors, uteral plus and fetal factors. Only thing is uteroplacental dysfunction is very important to say whether it is going to tolerate or not. And acute hypoxia can occur if it is a cord collapse, cord uh, a compression or entanglement that is there. So, fetal, in the case of the, how do we, can we make out the clinically? Yes, we can make out. Many a times they will tell reduced fetal movements, meconium stained amniotic fluid. In that, three grades are there. The third grade is very important. Brownish flakes, brown flakes, thick color, all of us we have seen, and fetal heart abnormality. Out of all these things, when we can catch the fetal heart abnormalities, that is the guide. How clinicians can reduce intrapartum birth asphyxia? 
it is by the fetal and maternal surveillance. Just I want to present this case. Who came to me in labor about three to four centimeters and she ruptured spontaneously and it's a meconium stain later. She wanted to know whether all is well because her neighbor had a cerebral palsy baby. So it is me who has to answer all these things. For us, we have intermittent auscultation. Many a times in our uh, government setup and the rural side, we do it. But now it is proved that Doppler is much better than the pinots what we use. And CTG, of course, it is available at every private hospital. But you know, however, much improvement is there. Uh, when about 40 to 50% of the deliveries are taking place in the rural areas where nothing is available. And next is the IE facilities are available. We can go for the fetal scalp, blood sampling, and pulse oximetry. What WHO said is intermittent auscultation for low risk, low resource countries is the good. But mind, all the previous speakers, as they said, it is the documentation, documentation, and documentation. And examine the mother completely. Don't give your um, assessment results by just looking at the interpartum graphs. You see the mother and then give your opinion. So is CTG for all? If given choice, I will tell, yes, it is CTG for all. In the beginning, I will do admission test. I will see whether this baby can tolerate the uterine contractions or not. Then if everything is okay, if it is a setup where CTG continuous monitoring is not available, I'll go for the intermittent auscultation. Otherwise, always it's better to go for the continuous. But what are the drawbacks with the uh, intermittent auscultation? Difficulty if the patient is obese and polyhydronase is present. And second thing is it is not possible to distinguish cord compression and placental insufficiency because in both it is the late deceleration curve is present. I will show you later. And baseline variability, graphic representation is not there in the case of the intermittent auscultation. So this is what is the recommendations that are there. But checklist, I told you, this is what is very important. Before starting the uh, cardiotogograph, you feel the, you hear the fetal heart first and then you arrange and feel for the maternal pulsation. So many times it is uh, I mean, uh, uh, confused with the maternal pulsations, all the time telling, yes, 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 fetal heart is good. Finally, we'll, we'll get one stillbirth baby. That's what is important. It has got the medical legal implementation. How frequently you are going to see? For a low risk patient, every 30 minutes in the first stage, every 15 minutes in the second stage. For high risk, 15 minutes in the half, uh, in the first stage and every five minutes in the second stage. Every time, uh, but this CTG should be done only after 32 weeks because the fetal nervous system, I told you, the baroreceptors and the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems are important for the changes in the fetal heart and see that it should be done after the contraction. And CTG is a graphical representation of the fetal heart rate and uterine contractions. It is not one, it's both the things are necessary. And can you identify this man? You see, whenever we do something, we should remember the people who are responsible for it. Can anybody tell? He is the caldera of ratio. Where do we get his name? It is the uterine contractions that are there. He is the one which is there. So it is followed during labor by the partogram. These two will go hand in hand. This. Uh, just for the because there are so many students that are there i just want to tell this is the graph paper that is there each uh, small vertical square is 10 beats if you want to count and small horizontal square is 10 seconds each large horizontal square is one minute this is the same about the uh, maternal contractions each small vertical is five millimeters of mercury normal ctg very easy only four things you have to remember baseline heart 110 to 160, variability 5 to 15 minutes, accelerations two or more in 20 minutes uh, of at least 15 beats per 50 seconds, decelerations are absent. This is normal. One thing we should remember is in a graph, if one acceleration is present, also we can say it is a reassuring time. 
uh, sign. If it is absent, also don't say that it is a bad sign. Wait for 20 minutes because the baby may be sleeping. You are not getting that acceleration. This we should remember. Non-reassuring also, it's very important. That is absent baseline variability with any of the following things. Along with the absent baseline variability, recurrent late deceleration, recurrent variable deceleration, bradycardia, and sinusoidal pattern. So, what are the controversies that are there in CTG? It has reduced the neonatal scissors, but increased the cesarean section rate. No benefit of the, over the cerebral policy or neonatal mortality and inter-observer variability is present. How do we read CTG? That is, all of you remember this uh, synonym, Dr. C. Bravedo, comprehensive assessment. The, uh, I will show all these things. First, define the risk. Yes, we know that these are the risk factors are there. And next is the contractions. Frequency, duration, intensity, and resting tone is very important because resting tone is increased in um, uh, cuvillary uterus where resting tone is in, uh, increased. And next is the... I don't know. Sorry. A baseline fetal heart rate, either it is a bradycardia or tachycardia that is present. Remember the rule of three. For the fetal bradycardia, when they are prolonged for three minutes, bradycardia if it is present, I told you normal is 110 by 160, below 160 if it comes, and more than three minutes if it is present, call for help. If it is six minutes, move to the theater, more than nine minutes, it will prepare for cesarean section because bradycardia is amnius than the tachycardia and only tachycardia if it is present there is no acidosis don't worry the maternal uh, uh, fever chorioamnionitis sympathomimetics all these things can produce but tachycardia with infection and acidosis it will be present it is omnius and bradycardia prolonged uh, decelerations absent variability again it shows it is the acidosis and bit to bit variability means that is the fluctuations what you are seeing here these are the fluctuations that are present it can be absent, it can be minimal, less than 5, moderate or market. This is the. And if it is too much, more than 25, be it bit to bit variability or absent below 5, these two are the ominous signs. Accelerations, I already told you that accelerations is a very good sign. Absence of acceleration, not necessarily, it is unfavorable sign. This we should remember. And decelerations, very important because these are the ones which we are going to dictate us that acidosis is going to happen. If it is an early deceleration, it is a head compression. How do you make out that uh, early deceleration state? Along with the uterine contractions, when peak is present, there is a dip and then it will go up. By that time, uterine contractions subside, the fetal heart comes back. That's what is the early deceleration. And variable and deceleration, yes, just give me two, one minute, I will finish. And late decelerations and uterine contraction. Uh, these are the things I already explained to you. This is very important, sinusoidal pattern, where there is no fluctuations at all. Occurs in vasoprevia, 20 to transmission, or RH isohumanization and drugs. And remember that parvo infection, this is one of the things that is there where um, hydramnios also will be present if it is a parvo infection. And prolonged deceleration is also present if it is an umbilical cord prolapse, a ruptured uterus, or eclampsia. These are the things that can happen. Overall impression is very important. Once you have assessed all aspects of the CTG, you need to determine your overall impression. That is what is the Bravido, Dr. C. Bravido, either reassuring, suspicious, or abnormal. This is the last slide, please see. By doing this, either RCOG, ACOG, whatever it is, it's going to decide whether it's a category one, category two, or three. Means I told you already, variabilities and all, depending upon those things, is it a normal, intermediate, or abnormal? It's going to decide. Then only you will see, depending upon that, and you are going to manage. Left lateral position, oxygen. Again, it is a controversy to give oxygen or not. And then depending upon the 
patient's progress of labor, you will decide whether you are going to give the vaginal delivery or you are going to take for the cesarean section where it is the safety of the patient is more important than anything else. And testing for fetal well-being, we have fetal stimulation. This is a very good one. How do you stimulate? Do a pelvic examination. If the baby moves, it says, yes, it is a stimulated event. You don't need to go to any other uh, sophisticated investigation. Just a pelvic examination is there. Fetal bed sampling, if it is available, you will see. If it is less than um, uh, uh, 7.2, abnormal uh, acidosis that is present. And take home is that fetal distress is fetal uh, encountering acute hypoxia. And in 50% of the cases, if minimal variability, no accelerations, late decelerations, metabolic acidosis is present. Do not make any decision about women's care in labor on the basis of CTG graphs because in the labor rooms we have seen postgraduates will be sending, taking the photo and sending them to the uh, professor to see and give the opinion. We have never seen the mother just by seeing the CTG. You cannot give opinion. Don't do that one. And a FOXY initiative that is the skill development module on Intrapartum care 2021 is really good and triage of every mother by allotting color code, protocols, partograms, and golden minute is very important. Follow the protocols, partogram is, is a success story is only that to detect hypoxia at early stage and um, follow the partogram and give a good baby to the mother. Thanks for the attention. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Dr. Ambuja, madam. And now, uh, with the permission of the convener, I move to session two, which comprises four talks by eminent speakers, Dr. Parikshit Tang, Dr. Jayashree Srinivasan, Dr. M.C. Patel, Dr. J.B. Sharma, and Dr. Niranjan Chavan. I would like to introduce the chairpersons for this session. The first chairperson is Dr. Kasturi Dunimat. She is immediate past president, Kasoga. Welcome, madam. Next chairperson is Dr. Rajesh S. Ravi, who is assistant professor at Malabar Medical College, Kozikode. Welcome, sir. We have Dr. Neema Acharya to chair the session. Madam is HOD and Professor Obzangaini at Datta Mege Institute of Medical Sciences, Varda. Uh, we have Dr. Jairani Kamraj, madam, to chair the session, who is uh, the managing committee member of OGSSI. And last but not least, we have Dr. Girish Mane, sir, to chair the session, who is past chairperson of Adolescent Committee of Foxy. Welcome, chairpersons. And please, uh, I would now introduce, uh, I would uh, request uh, Dr. Kasturi, madam, if she's uh, joined, to introduce yeah, yeah, Dr. Here. Parikshit. Yeah. Ma'am, please join us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Monika. Uh, I, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Parikshit Tang, sir. Sir is a consultant at Ashwini Maternity and Surgical Hospital Center and Endoscopy Center, Mumbai. He is a consultant at Jupiter Hospital, Thane. Sir is an honorary professor at Udaipur, consultant for more than 16 centers for ART centers. He is a treasurer of FOXI, chairperson Safe Motherhood Committee 2014-2017, postgraduate teacher, examiner uh, for College of Physicians and Surgeons of Mumbai, and examiner for MRC was the part three, managing committee member. And he has won so many awards and he has so many publications to his credit. Sir has won a gold medal for his first place at DNB. Dr. Kamil Rao, UFOX Oration 2011 and 12, over 100 peer reviewed publications in index journals, and co authored four books in OBGYN. It's my pleasure to introduce you, sir, to uh, present you such a pioneer in the subject. And the topic is also very interesting. Nowadays, the students, the younger generation are forgetting the art of forceps. So, sir is here to enlighten you about this procedure. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kasturi. Nice to meet everybody today. And it's really uh, a pleasure to be on this ICOG platform. Uh, I thank the organizers, uh, Dr. Sneha, Dr. Monika, all the conveners for this uh, kind invitation to be with all of you today, this evening, and share some thoughts about uh, forceps delivery. So my presentation uh, is going to be in two parts. First, I'm going to show you 
uh, a regular PowerPoint and then I'll show you some videos. If I'm allowed to share my screen. Yes, okay, uh, that's great. Uh, let me go straight away into screen mode. Okay, uh, am I on full screen? Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, so as uh, Dr. Kasturi very correctly said that, you know, instrumental vaginal delivery is today becoming a forgotten art, but I must emphasize that it is still an essential skill. Why is it essential? Because it is a tried and trusted established part of obstetric practice. It can help you to avoid difficult and potentially you know, complicated cesareans at full dilatation, especially when the station is very low. Uh, Dr. Harish Doshi just spoke very beautifully about deep transverse arrest and how one could deal with that with instrumentation. Uh, ultimately, we want vaginal births for those women who are eligible and for whom it is safe. So this is one way in which you can reduce cesarean rates. And in a bind in a situation where you want to quickly achieve delivery, this is a much better option than trying a cesarean. Why are we forgetting this art? Because we are worried. You know, we are worried that uh, the mother is worried that the baby will be injured. There are medical legal concerns. Cesarean is safer than ever. And the rates of forceps use even as compared to vacuum amongst modern obstetricians is falling and therefore training is on a decline. So what happens is uh, we get into this cycle, you know, because there is fear, there is avoidance. Because there is avoidance, our skill levels drop. And when we do something where the skill level is not adequate, you get bad outcomes. Once you get bad outcomes, you start uh, fearing that particular procedure or process even more than what you did earlier. And this goes into a circle. So what we have to realize is that the use of forceps in modern obstetrics and in obstetrics in general, modern, old, future, whatever, is not with force, but with skill, non V said R. Where do we go from here? What's the way forward? We have to become fearless. And by fearless, I don't mean careless. I mean that our fear of this process or procedure should now reduce if we practice by protocol and we keep up our medical and medical legal safeguards and we need training. We need training by simulators, by having mentors who will teach on the job and by attending meetings, workshops, CMEs, such as this one. It clearly shows that, you know, there are 400 people in uh, even today's CME who are interested in knowing about forceps, about when tos and conducting such deliveries. So when we say practice by protocol, what do we mean? We mean there should be an established indication and we should make sure that the contraindications have been ruled out. Medical safeguard should be there. What is that concept of trial instrumental delivery? Choose the right instrument. Avoid the common pitfalls of instrumentation. And there is a concept called parallelism in forceps, which I'll be elaborating on a little more. The medical legal safeguards are quite standard. You have to have a counseling, a consent, and a documentation for any procedure. And that holds true even for forceps delivery. It is not uh, as if this is just a part of a routine process. It is a procedure, and therefore it's much better to have a documented uh, consent and what happened, the documentation of the process. Now, when we look at indications, prophylactic forceps as Envisioned by Joseph Bolivar Dili, you know, Dili's forceps. That concept of prophylaxis is now uh, no longer valid. But you can still use the forceps to minimize maternal exertion in situations like a heart disease, preeclampsia, neurological problems, anemia, if it's a SGA baby. 
if the second stage is prolonged, mother is exhausted, or if there's an abnormal fetal status, then all these indications have stood the test of time. So, you know, the standard indication of wanting to expedite delivery for maternal or fetal well-being, that's the, you know, medical standard at which indication should be paid. What are the contraindications? Definite CPD, malpresentations, especially if there is a brow or a face with mento posterior. I would go on to say that even mento anterior face, I mean, today, very few people skilled enough to do it. High station of the presenting part, cervix is not fully dilated. If there are disorders of fetal structure or coagulation, then don't do any instrumentation, not a faucet certainly. Where do you draw the line? You know, what is high enough? So today, high forceps or high instrumentation is completely out. I mean, uh, that's not acceptable in modern obstetrics. Uh, mid, okay, there are still some uh, old fossils, uh, <laughs> including yours truly, who does it. But, you know, exceptional circumstances, taking in view all the safety precautions, but most of the times what we are dealing with is a low or an outlet. And this is something which almost every obstetrician should be able to accomplish without too much of uh, complications and without too much of trouble. One concept is a trial of instrumental delivery. Means you have to have the mental attitude that if there is a problem, I'm not going to persist with this. Always do it in the operation theater. I often do forceps under spinal anesthesia with the cesarean trolley ready. It's already opened up. But the important thing is to know when to stop. In fact, I treat almost every forceps delivery. Think of it as a trial of instrumental delivery. It's always better to be overprepared in obstetrics. There's a lot of talk, you know, about forceps versus vacuum, what does what, what is better, so on and so forth. But I think that's a very childish kind of a comparison. Each instrument has its own uh, pluses. Each one has its own problems. So forceps is very good because it can give you good traction, a moderate to strong traction can be applied, and it promotes flexion, compression, and rotation. If you know how to do a rotation forceps, and if you're using a parallel forceps, it can correct asynclitism for you. Ventus is great because it does auto rotation for you, but the traction is weak to moderate, and there's no compression involved when you apply a Ventus. So forceps is, and Ventus, a lot of comparisons have been done. Just one thing to understand, Vacuum extraction is more likely to fail as compared to a forceps, especially when you're doing anything above outlet. If you're doing anything above outlet, think about doing a forceps rather than a ventus. This is my personal opinion. Uh, I'll keep the videos for later. We'll talk about asynclitism, parallelism, how it directs it. And I'll just stop here with the PowerPoint. Is consent mandatory? I think. You know, one could argue that, you know, uh, it's a life-saving procedure and you just did it at the spur of the moment because it was so urgent. But I think today, any medical procedure, you do it with a written informed consent and have a good documentation of the instrumental birth. Why did you do it? How did you do it? What happened? Where was the head? What were the precautions that you took? And how many attempts, so on and so forth, and if there were any injuries. So that's uh, what I have to say about uh, the, okay, now I'm going to just show a couple of videos to illustrate this aspect. Uh, is my video being seen? No, sir. No, not at present. I think the power the PowerPoint only is seen at present. Uh, okay, okay. So we not what I'll do is I'll stop sharing that. Stop share and yeah. And I'll go to sharing the screen.
uh, right here we go. Yeah, now it's seen, sir. Yeah. वीडियो में ऑडियो है क्या यस ऑडियो शेयर नहीं हुआ है ओके नो प्रॉब्लम आई आई विल द ऑडियो यस सो हियर व्हाट वी आर डिपिक्टिंग इज अ सिचुएशन वेयर देयर इज परफेक्ट सिंक्लिटिज्म एज यू कैन सी दिस इज द सूचर एंड इट इज एग्जैक्टली मिडवे बिटवीन द प्यूबिक सिंफाइसिस एंड द सेक्रल प्रोमोंटल बट वी नो दैट इज रेयरली एवर ट्रू इन रियल लाइफ always there is some degree of acyclitism that means the suture is either a little anterior or it is posterior and this is probably an underrated when it comes to instrumental deliveries that's one of the reasons why there are difficulties why instrumental deliveries may fail so let's see how a uh, parallel forceps can uh help to correct this okay now what's being seen video is visible yes yes okay great so here you can see this is occiput between lot and loa and you are applying the parallel forceps blade the sagittal suture is quite posterior now look what happens when the blades are applied the blades will not lock at the same level you'll see me pointing to the shanks and you'll see that the blades are like that they are not exactly locked in the same so this pull and this adjustment is what will help you to correct the asynclitism as the baby comes out through the head and this parallelism is what helps you to prevent and reduce the injuries which can happen to the baby's head and to the uh, to the fetus and this is now a practical actual video oh sorry it's the same one sorry uh this is the last one uh parallel forceps space view so you know this is our typical situation uh, what we have primary post dates you know induced she is under epidural fully dilated for a couple of hours and she has been pushing now she is exhausted head is not palpable station plus 1 to plus 2 small caput just be careful here don't uh, get misled so what you are doing is an assessment to make sure that the contraindications are ruled out and then you flex the thighs up on the abdomen see these small things you know they will add half a centimeter 1 centimeter of space and that is so vital when you are in this you know tight fit kind of situation so here i'm using the parallel forceps left blade goes to the left side right blade goes to the right side the handles do not cross they are in parallel now once you are sure that you have secured a lock then the next step is not to the episiotomy till this point even now you do a trial pull make sure that the head is budging a bit once you are confident then you ask the assistant to just hold it up and then you proceed give the episiotomy make sure it is medio lateral always go a little more lateral than what you think is needed and once you made that adequate medio lateral episiotomy you are going to make sure that the mucosa is cut a little more than what you need uh, that's where the tears and all are bad if it's ragged so then you have your perineal support being given and you follow the curve of carus so to the floor then towards you and then to the ceiling that's the way you go about delivering you do these small rotatory and rocking movements to kind of dislodge the baby's head and here as you can see it's a face to pubes delivery and then you get the rest of the baby out and uh, have the baby suctioned and so on and so forth 
what that's what I had about uh, forceps deliveries, and uh, you know I hope yes I have thankfully finished in time. Thank you, sir. It was an excellent presentation, very useful. I think all the delegates students who have joined, it's very useful, and um, they have to learn this skill. It is a need of the hour, so to reduce the C sections. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Parikshit. That was wonderful. And the videos were mesmerizing, really needed for the new generation to learn. Thank you so much, once again. Thank you, Dr. And go ahead. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Tang. And now we move to uh, the second talk. The second talk is by Dr. Jeshri Srinivasan, madam. And to chair her talk, I invite our chairperson, Dr. Rajesh Ravi. Is Dr. Rajesh? Yes. Yeah. Dr. Rajesh is an associate professor from Calicut. Thank you, madam. Uh, so we have uh, a good talk on this uh, art and science of forceps delivery by sir. So now we can hear about the other, uh, which is the type competitor of the forceps delivery, that is the vacuum assisted delivery. So we'll hear it from uh, Dr. Jayasri, madam, Jayasri Sinvas, madam. We say um, senior obstetrician and gynecologist from Samvida Medical College, Chennai. Over to you, madam. Thank you. Let me share the one minute. Minimize it, ma'am. Yes. Uh, Madam, please minimize the Zoom window and open your presentation first, PPT. Ma'am, just minimize that, uh, minimize button, Madam. And the Zoom, uh, and the, uh, you come later, Ma'am. On the side, Ma'am, and the dash, Ma'am, and the minimize, Ma'am. Minimize screen. No, go to Ma'am, Ma'am. No, Ma'am, the dash, minimize screen. Ma'am, 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 Ma'am. No, I'm not able to see it has gone off. See over the screen, the next you come on the straight line, ma'am. Huh? It's on the corner of the left corner. Yeah, just little down. That will be the minimizing screen. No, that's not shown here. That's why. Uh, oh, very close, ma'am. Your, your, your mark is very close only, ma'am. No, 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 actually, she has already shared a screen. That's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, okay. madam, can, madam can open the PowerPoint. That would be better. Okay. Just open your presentation, madam. That should be it. Double click it. Uh, you can show. Uh, that is the, um, the final vacuum. You have the presentation. Yes, ma'am. Click it, ma'am. Yes. Ma'am, that's it. Now put us. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, ma'am. Okay. Thank you so much. I really congratulate the ICOG team and Dr. Sneha for this wonderful uh, certification course. And um, thanks to Dr. Parikshit, who has made my job very, very easier. As he said, uh, we are not here to debate whether uh, forceps is good or vacuum is good. We are joining hands in <clears throat> promoting the art of instrumental delivery. That's what we are going to do. And he has really given Whatever he has said about the consent and all those things, it applies very well to my vacuum also. So of the instrumental delivery, you have ventus, which means a soft cup in French, and we have the forceps. You heard a lot about forceps now, and this ventus is an instrument decided to designed to assist delivery discovered by Malmstrom in 1956. It works by creating vacuum between the fetal scalp and the cup. Traction is applied on the scalp or the cranium, and actually we are pulling the baby by the scalp. In forceps, the traction is on the, at the base of the skull. So the parts of the vacuum instrument is the extraction cup 
and the vacuum generator with the gauge and this is the connecting tube. We have a lot of uh, thing. The original Malmstrom one had uh, this metallic cups, small, medium, and large. And now after that, we have this uh, rigid plastic ones. And now we have the PC silicone cups, which you can fold and nicely apply. So the classification for operative vaginal delivery, this um, holds good both for vacuum as well as for um, forceps. In vacuum, we prefer only as uh, Dr. Parikshit said, it is best to apply only the outlet, which means the fetal scalp is visible without separating the labia. Fetal skull has reached the pelvic floor and fetal head is at or on the perineum. Sagittal suture is an anteroposterior diameter, which is very ideal, or right or left anterior or posterior position. When you say it is low, the leading point of the skull is at station plus two centimeters or more, and not on the pelvic floor. Two subdivisions are there, rotation of 45 degrees or less, or rotation of 45 de more than 45 degrees. The mid, mid one is station is between zero and two, and high, we are not preferring it. Mid and high are not preferred. So now, what are the indications for this? The fetal indications and the maternal indications. Mainly, it is the fetal distress, suspicion of fetal compromise, and mostly malrotation can be corrected by this. The maternal indications are inadequate, uh, expensive efforts, maternal exhaustion, or expensive efforts to be avoided in such conditions like cardiac disease, hypertensive crisis, cerebrovascular disease, and so on. Or it can be prolonged second stage of labor. In a nullipara, we call it more than two hours. And in uh, multipara, it is uh, less than one hour. That is without anesthesia. If there is epidural, then you can give little more relevance. And to cut short the second stage of labor, as in severe preeclampsia, cardiac disease, and post-cesarean pregnancy as well. So what are the prerequisites for vacuum-assisted vaginal delivery? This complete cervical dilatation, but you can go ahead. As we are doing outlet, it is always complete cervical dilatation, but if you are going little high, then even eight centimeters or nine centimeters cervical dilatation can be made to full dilatation by the application of the cup. And membranes should have been ruptured, otherwise it would slip. And it should be vertex presentation, Head is engaged with position known and very important, empty the bladder, otherwise it would prevent the descent of the head and there should not be any fetal pelvic disproportion. You can have adequate analgesia if she is already on epidural analgesia, well and good, or if she is very, uh, very finicky about pain and other things, you can use a local anesthesia or pudendal block or if it is just outlet, you can apply without anything. Probably for episiotomy, you will infiltrate, do the local infiltration. Caesarean section capability is very, very important, as uh, Dr. Parikshit said, and experienced operator. You should have a passion to apply the instruments. Otherwise, and if you don't know how to apply, please don't venture. Have someone to um, guide you. always going on the wrong side. So now, okay, how to apply? Select a correct size of the cup, retract the vaginal wall, fold the edges of the cup because we are now using the silastic cup, it is easy to fold and insert it into the vagina. Place it over the flexion point, Make sure no vaginal or cervical tissue is caught. You have to pass your index finger all around to see that the cervix is free, cervix or the vagina is free. And then hold the cup in its position, create vacuum at the rate of 0.2 kg per centimeter squared. Let it reach up to 0.8 uh, 
kg per centimeter square allow adequate time for the Shignan formation. Now, the most important thing is, what is the flexion point I was talking about? The flexion point is situated along the sagittal suture and it is three centimeters in front of the posterior fontanelle and it is six centimeters from the anterior fontanelle. Why we uh, prefer this? Because proper placement of over the flexion point facilitates maximum traction and it promotes flexion and minimizes cup detachment and prevents twisting of fetal head, allows smallest diameter of the head during delivery. So next is the traction, exercise caution, pendulum or rocking movements from side to side will not work here as it could help in forceps because this leads on to detachment of the cup. Maintain constant traction for um, duration of contraction. Discontinue traction if audible hissing is heard, which signals loss of vacuum and the cup is going to slip out. Repeat steps until delivery of the head is complete. Maximum of three pulls is allowed. Traction should be intermittent and should coincide with the uterine contraction and bearing down efforts. Traction should be at right angles to the fetal head and along the pelvic axis. So how do we assess the progress? The first pull causes flexion of the head. I said three pulls. First pull causes flexion of the head and some descent. And by the second pull, head should be on the pelvic floor. By the third pull, delivery of the head should be complete. With strong maternal contractions and effective maternal efforts, delivery should be achieved by one or two pulls in outlet vacuum extractions or two or three pulls in low vacuum extraction and vacuum should be avoided in mid pelvic positions. So not more than three tentative pulls. And as I told you, do not twist, do not torque or use excessive force. In forceps as well as in uh, vacuum, the force must be at the, you should sit in front of the patient and the force should come from your elbow and not from your shoulder. Don't have people stand by, the, uh, stand by you at the back to hold you when you're falling. It should not be the thing. It should be a pleasure to watch you applying the forceps or the vacuum. And uh, really, once there is delivery, uh, release the vacuum with release button after delivery of the head. Ease cup off the scalp, complete birth in the normal manner. <clears throat> after delivery, examine the baby's head immediately after birth for scalp injury and note cup application site. Inspect scalp regularly if difficulty was experienced you, uh, to exclude bleeding in the subgaleal space. Reassure patients that chigna, which is the artificial caput that has been formed, should disappear in a matter of hours and that marks from cup should leave no traces after a few days. Re-examine the baby within 24 hours to check the application site of vacuum cup. The complications are maternal and fetal complications. The maternal complications are cervical or vaginal lacerations due to entrapment of tissue between suction cup and fetal head. If this happens, it is the applicator's mistake. You should take all the precautions to go all around the cup to see that the cervix and the vagina are freed already. And this produces the typical annular cervical tear or it can produce a small buttonhole tear also if it has got one small portion. And this is due to the entrapment of cervical tissue and nothing else. This can cause significant PPH can have implications in future pregnancy. If goes unnoticed, it can produce some sort of stricture and stenosis and future pregnancy and delivery can be uh, interfered with. The fetal complications, scalp injuries, 
this shignan is not a complication. It is by forming this shignan only, you're pulling the baby out. But there can be abrasions and lacerations and scalp necrosis. All this occur when you apply a mid-cavity uh, vacuum. Uh, when the baby's head is high up, up and you have to apply a lot of pressure or you have to pull uh, quite a lot. Kefelhebentoma is one of the problems. And because of this, jaundice and well, neonatal jaundice and anemia can occur. And intracranial hemorrhage and subgalial hemorrhage. When you see here, this is the subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is again subarachnoid hemorrhage. And this is the subgalial hematoma. And uh, this is severe contusion of the scalp. And this, of course, is. So the advantages of vacuum over forceps, again, I'm not here to debate whether this is good or that is good. But we should know, the, um, unless we know the advantages and the disadvantages, we will not be able to choose the correct instrument at the time of delivery. So vacuum is easier to apply, less force applied to fetal head, less anesthesia is needed, no need for complete dilatation of cervix, no compression of fetal head, reduced maternal injury and reduced fetal scalp injury if applied properly. So the, there are disadvantages of vacuum over forceps. The cup may detach during procedure, used only for term or near-term vertex presentations. You can't apply it on preterm babies. Possibly longer delivery time as traction is applied only during contractions and you have to wait till you create the shignan. Possibly associated with more head trauma. Uh, this again is a uh, higher one, higher application may not be the ideal in severe fetal distress where you need to take the baby out in a jiffy. So we have another one, what is called kiwi cup. All along I have been to, uh, to showing you the um, um, bolder ones, models. Now we have this hand pump system. Here you don't need any assistant to pump or do any such thing. Here this is just can be held in the, uh, this thing is called a palm cup also, palm vacuum. The integral design provides a simple hand vacuum pump, a thumb or finger activated release. So this is the uh, one and an accurate vacuum indicator is there. Design for this is the cup and this is the small short uh, connecting tube. Designed for complete control without an assistant and provides a safe and effective system in the palm of the hand. Advantage is when used in cesarean sections as well. We have one more device. This is a better uh, thing of uh, vacuum. This is called Odon device. The wonderful thing about this is uh, this is invented by Mr. George Odon, who is a car mechanic. This device is. Yes, one more minute. Like polythene material and looks like a plastic bag, which is inserted with the help of an inserter, inflated around the baby's head and traction is given to pull it out. Safer alternative than forceps and vacuum extractor, potential for wide application in poor resource settings by mid-level providers. That is why I was keen on showing this. So the steps to remember, Safety guidelines are pull only with maternal pushing, never apply torsion or rotation, time procedure from moment of application of cup until delivery of the infant, duration of time is not more than 20 minutes, and abandon after two pop-offs. Abandon if no fetal descent. Ah, steps to remember is A to J, ask for help, bladder empty, cervix fully dilated, determine fetal station, equipment to be ready, fontanel and flexion point assessment F, G is gentle traction along curve of carus, 
halt in between contractions, halt if pop-offs or cup detachment or three or more than three pull, incision, that is episiotomy if required, and jaw release vacuum if baby's jaw is seen. Conclusion is vacuum delivery has been proven to be useful in assisting with the vaginal delivery. The potential for both fetal and maternal injury does exist. The operator must be familiar with the indications, contraindications, applications, and the use of the vacuum device. Safe and effective guidelines should exist to facilitate a safe and effective delivery. And the simulation lab must be made use of by the PGs so that they will get used to the procedure. Thank you. Now, shall I go on to the video? One, just one minute video only. Uh, okay. If one minute, I think you can run. Is it in the PPT itself or video separately? Separate. Okay, ma'am. Can okay. I? You, you need to stop share this PPT then. Yeah. I'm not finding it here. Yeah, close. Yeah. Are you able to see? Yes, 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 ma'am. Yes. See how it was folded and sent inside. So the second one is in cesarean. I think, madam, uh, that was wonderful. But uh, oh, this is just a few, yeah. few seconds only. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Perfect. That was wonderful, madam. Uh, we can stop sharing now. Uh, I'm sure these videos are uh, really going to make the difference. And uh, the younger generation is definitely going to be stimulated for learning all these instrumental deliveries, I think. Thank you so much, madam. And over to the chairperson, if any comment. Madam, you can please stop sharing your screen. Thank you, madam. That was actually a wonderful session. Uh, it has exclusively covered almost all the points regarding vacuum delivery and um, coming from a senior professor, it actually going back to the lecture classes once more. Uh, so, uh, and the videos were excellent also, madam. You have taken pain. That's why I know you wanted to show it uh, anyway. <laughs> Thank you, madam. Thank you for uh, motivating the younger generation to go with the vacuum delivery and try uh, for it. Thank you, madam. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rajesh. Yeah. Madam, uh, if you can please stop sharing. Uh, okay. Nilima, if you can help her. Yes, over Thank to you, Monica. You can go ahead. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jeshri Srinivasan, madam. And thank you, Dr. Rajesh, for sharing this session. And those videos were superlative. Too good. And now for the next talk, I invite none other than Dr. M.C. Patel, sir.
who is a great speaker. And to chair the session, I invite Dr. Neema Acharya from Vardha Medical College, Datta Megi Medical College, Vardha. Has Dr. Neema joined? She was not able to unmute herself. Can, yeah, yeah. Dr. Neema, uh, can the tech team unmute Dr. Neema Acharya, please? Yeah, yeah, they have unmuted me. Thank you, ma'am. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome, Dr. Neema. Yeah. So the outset, let me congratulate ICOG and the tremendous efforts Neha, Sneha ma'am and Monica ma'am have taken to coordinate a wonderful academic event. So it's an honor for me to introduce Dr. M.C. Patel, who actually doesn't need introduction. So let me just do the formality. He's a consultant, obstetrician, gynecologist, and medical legal counselor, vice president, Foxy 2018, organizing secretary, AICOG 2017, chairperson, ethics, and medical legal committee, Foxy 11 to 13, honorable secretary, uh, state organization of gynecologists and obstetrician, Gujarat, organizing chairperson, MMCON 2018, Honorable Member, National Inspection and Monitoring Committee, PCPNDT government, PNDT uh, Act, Government of India, 2015. Honorable Member, State Supervisory Board, PNDT Committee, Gujarat State, 2005 to 9. President, Ahmedabad, OBGY Society, 10, and 11, 10 to 11. Honorable Member, National Managing Body, Indian Red Cross Society, uh, 19 to 22. National uh, President National Medico Medicos Organization Medicos Organization 2016 to 18. President IMA Ahmedabad Branch 2007 to 8. Honorary Surgeon Indian Red Cross I Bank collected more than thousand IPFs and organizing chairperson Vivekan and NMO Con 2013. Over to you, sir, and it's an honor to chair this session. Thank you. Thank you, Nima Madam, yeah, for kind you. words. And let, let me, me allow to yeah. share my screen. Yeah. Is it full screen? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. So straight away to the subject. Greetings from Statue of Unity, tallest statue of world. And we all are proud of that statue. Sudden obstetric collapse is the subject given to me. Save the patient, but save yourself as well is the topic for discussion. Warm welcome all the delegates and wishing you a litigation free practice. At the outset, I would like to ICOG team and Dr. Sneha Bhuyar and Dr. Monika Singh in particular for inviting me to share my views about the subject. And before I go to subject, it is my humble appeal uh, for my future candidature for President Foxy, election year 2024. Respected seniors and dear colleagues, serving Foxy for years together on this auspicious day, with folded hands and down head, I seek your guidance, blessings, and support to endorse my candidature for the post of Oxy President, year 2026, election year 2024. Consistently working for Oxy and trying to visit even a smaller society and to assist our common Foxian friends in any given situation, I have tried to serve Oxy. I assure to serve Foxy in the same way with the same zeal and enthusiasm. Pataka antima lakshanahi, siha sanachar tejana, liye sabi ko saad, aage hai bada tejana. So, please endorse my candidature for post of President Foxy, considering my senior, seniority, sincerity, dedication, and easily availability to be helpful to any Foxian friends in any odd given situation. So is it worth discussing? Yes. And if it is, yes, then why? Because in our day-to-day -day obstetric practice, we take utmost care of any of our patients, but accident may happen at any time, and it may end up into litigation many a times. This gentleman have so many staircases, but he doesn't know how to use them. It doesn't matter how many resources you have. If you do not know how to use them, they will never be enough. So there are so many provisions in our day-to-day -day medical practice and a, a, which are favoring in our uh, uh, litigation cases. But if we do not know, then they won't be useful. And if you touch 
uh, in medicine at wrong place, then you will be punished. And as far as sudden obstetric collapse is concerned, of course, it is rare, but potentially dangerous and life-threatening condition, treatable if diagnosed and managed efficiently and effectively in time. So start resuscitation immediately. It is very much required and search for probable cause quickly. As we know, major cause is hemorrhage. It could be antepartum or postpartum, but as far as massive obstetric hemorrhage is concerned, it is the main cause as far as sudden obstetric collapse is concerned. If there is no hemorrhage, then we have to quickly spot diagnosis of probable causes other than hemorrhage. So non-hemorrhagic regions, it could be eclampsia, rupture of uterus, acute uterine inversion, anesthesia complications, Mendelssohn's syndrome, acute myocardial infarction or any other condition, trauma, drug reaction or overdose, anaphylactic reaction, amniotic fluid embolism, ectopic pregnancy, pulmonary embolism. So very quickly we have to go for quick diagnosis, history of severe hypertension and convulsion, think for eclampsia, history of grand multipara, previous uterine scar or instrumental delivery, think for rupture of uterus, history of mismatch third, uh, third stage of labor, short cord or a manual removal of a placenta, think for inversion of uterus, history of fall in BP, with, uh, within a with few seconds of spinal anesthesia, think for supine spinal shock, history of spinal anesthesia in higher position, difficulty in uh, spinal anesthesia, and just after that, complaining of heaviness in chest, gabramar, breathlessness, with few minutes of uh, uh, spinal anesthesia, think for high spinal anesthesia, history of vomiting under anesthesia, problem starts within few hours then think for Mendelssohn syndrome, history of previous cardiac problems, complaint of acute left-sided chest pain, uneasiness, hypotension, think for maternal cardiac problems and mainly maternal uh, myocardial infarction also, history of vehicular accident or domiciliary violence, think for trauma, history of collapse after administration of drug and sign and symptom of allergic reaction, drug reaction or overdose is to be kept in mind, history of painful stimuli or injections, it could be anaphylactic reaction, history of collapse immediately after delivery, mainly in multipara and in precipitate labor and no obvious cause is seen or in any case always think for amniotic fluid embolism, history of sudden onset of unexplained dyspnea, tachypnea and especially in western country because venous stasis and hypercoagulability of blood is very common there, think for pulmonary thromboembolic phenomena. So most important prerequisite for success in sudden obstetric collapse is don't allow yourself to be collapsed. So do not lose confidence. Your confidence and presence of mind will determine the outcome of patient. Do not be penny, do not be emotional, and do not waste precious time. So you have to start resuscitations very immediately. Keep labor room and OT ready to deal with any crisis, even if you are dealing with a normal labor or instrumental or operative one. So what to do immediately? Stepwise resuscitation is the key of success. EBC and that is advanced cardiac life support is the protocol. Management speed makes the difference and resuscitation protocol is the same in pregnant and non-pregnant patient with fewer modification. Consider physiological changes due to pregnancy. During resuscitation, you are dealing with two patients, mother and fetus, you should keep in mind. And the best hope of fetal survival is maternal survival. So maintain the following, it is the goal of therapy. Systolic pressure should be more than 90 mm of Hg. Urine output should be more than 0.5 ml per kg per hour and normal mental status, that is orientation of the patient and eliminate the cause, try to eliminate cause as quickly as possible. And as far as ABC protocol is concerned, it reminds the importance of airway, breathing and circulation for maintenance of life. Loss or loss of control of any of this will rapidly lead to death. Airway, breathing and circulation will work in cascade. Mm -hmm. So first step is shout for help. If you are dealing alone, 
it, it won't be sufficient in this situation. So always go for help and be ready to be helpful to your professional colleagues whenever you are called for help. Multi-speciality team approach is a secret of success. So as far as CPR part is concerned, it is to be begin with assessment. So assess responsiveness, tap on shoulder of victim, are you okay? Omit step if patient is under anesthesia. Turn victim in supine position, but if patient is pregnant, then left lateral position uh, is very good. So 15 to 20 degree tilt is very much required. Airway, it is to be checked first, whether it is open or it is blocked. Once airway is clear, then evaluate breathing of patient and search for other regions for absence of breathing besides blockage of airway. Because effective circulation is vital for exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And cardiac arrest is mainly ultimate cause of clinical death. And it is linked to an absence of circulation. So open the airway with head tilt and chin lift. And it is very um, obvious thing that make sure Fingers are not on soft uh, 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 spot. Lift the chin with one hand, uh, push down, and other hand, forehead, uh, uh, forehead with other hand. And access the breathing. So look, listen, and feel. But it should be very quickly. You should not waste time for the same. And normal breathing rate should be between 12 to 20 per minute. No breathing, then give two breaths. Pinch the nose, seal your mouth over victim's mouth and deliver two effective breaths that can make <coughs> chest rise. So this is the method where to go for two quick breaths. And auscultation and percussion of chest if time permits to listen normal chest sounds and any other abnormality. Pulse oximetry useful in assigning oxygen concentration of blood. In conscious patient or where a pulse and breathings are clearly present, then immediately look for life-threatening condition like pulmonary edema and hemothorax. And checking for general respiratory distress, that is use of accessory muscles, abdominal breathing, position of the patient. Patient is orthopnic many times in this type of condition, sweating and sinusitis. So all this should go very quickly. And due to decreased functional residual capacity and increased O2 demand, Hypoxia can be <coughs> developed very rapidly in a, a case of pregnancy. So always be prepared to support with oxygenation and ventilation. And ventilation uh, volumes need to be reduced due to elevated mother's diaphragm due to pregnancy. And once with clear airway and efficient breathing, oxygen is delivered to lung and then it needs circulation to be effective to deliver it to rest of the body. And Originally, the ABC part C was meant for carotid pulse, but now it is no longer recommended. It is failed to detect in 40% of the victim with pulse and 10% victims with without pulse as far as carotid tracing is concerned. So there is less risk of harm by performing chest compression on beating heart rather than failing to perform them on non-beating heart. So compression is very much Required. So emphasis uh, for more on uh, chest compression and it buys few minutes till some other helps come or ambulance comes if it is roadside problem and if you are dealing with this type of situation. Previously in 2000 guidelines, 15 compression and two rescue breeze were recommended. But after 2005 guidelines, 30 compressions for every two rescue breeze are recommended. And with each chest compression in a series, coronary perfusion pressure improves and blood circulation increases with sequential uh, <coughs> compensation. So position yourself at the victim side. Vic victim must be lying on firm flat surface. For male victim, remove all the clo clothes and expose chest. For female victim, do not remove her last garment. So push hard, push fast, and press down up to one and a half to two inches. And this is the how <coughs> compression should be done. So compression, relaxation, and compression, uh, uh, compression. And compression rate should be 100 per minute. 
and <coughs> compression ventilation ratio 30 to 2. Do not bend your elbows because it should be very much straight. Otherwise, compression will not be that effective. And remember, 30 compressions plus two breaths means one cycle. You go with five cycles and then change rescuer to avoid rescue fatigue because then after compression will not be that effective. So after five cycles, rescuer should be changed. It was a very interesting study which came in uh, uh, by University of London. 1,951 patients were <coughs> taken for uh, uh, study and out of those 980 patients were simply given chest compression and 916 were given both chest compression and <coughs> mouth to mouth breathing. In first group, survival to hospital discharge rate was 12.5% and in second half, it was 11% survival rate. So it, there was no much difference. So if you go with simple compression, then all it, it is fine. But it should be <coughs> started very immediately. And same study which came with British study included 1300 people and there is the same conclusion as far as compression and or compression and uh, rescue breaths are concerned. It is, there is one more interesting thing. Always add 1000 before your every number. 1001, 1002, 1003. Because it mimics a normal bits of heart. And rate should be 100 per minute with full recoil. <clears throat> as far as circulation part is concerned, and some modification of basic life support. Perform chest compression higher and slightly above the center of st sternum because in pregnancy there is elevation of diagram, diaphragm and of abdominal content. As far as vasopressor agents are concerned, usually epinephrine and vasopressin will decrease blood flow to the uterus. But if they are needed and if they are life saving, then we have to go with epinephrine or vasopressin if it is indicated. As far as part D is concerned, that is defibrillation, would you consider should defibrillation be available in OT, the definite treatment step for cardiac arrest. But as far as defibrillation part is concerned, we have to uh, consider that very condition also. As far as excessive magnesium sulfate part is concerned, if you are dealing with a case of eclampsia, and if we are, uh, if you have given a magnesium sulfate, it is all likely that there could be overdose of magnesium sulfate and there could be some respiratory problem. So, iatrogenic overdose is possible in women with eclampsia, particularly if woman becomes oliguric. So, administration of calcium gluconate is treatment of choice and empirical calcium administration may be life-saving in this type of condition. But in all this uh, condition, one uh, part, uh, uh, this resuscitation is continued and we have to think for urgent delivery also. Why urgent delivery indicated? Because autocable compression relieve and it increases venous return, it increases cardiac output, ventilation improved, functional residuous capacity is improved, oxygenation is improved and oxygen consumption is reduced. CO2 production is reduced and improved maternal and neonatal survival chances. So as far as cesarean delivery is concerned in this type of situation, many a times near miss death or if we can call it perimortem also, if, if there is a cardiac arrest then. It has to be within three to four minutes passed since a cardiac arrest. Has the mother responded to resuscitation, we have to quickly judge and watch resuscitation optimal can it be improved? And then we have to quickly go for decision as far as cesarean delivery part is concerned. Start by four minutes, deliver by five minutes from time of arrest. Perform operation in patient's room only. Need not to be shifted in OT. Don't worry about sterility. Vertical abdominal incision very quickly. Prepare for uterine hypotonia and bleeding also. Would you consider the need for emergency cesarean delivery? As soon as a pregnant woman develops cardiac arrest, yes. Best survival rate for infant if it is more than 28 weeks occurs when delivery of infant occurs in less than 5 minutes after mother's heart stops beating and requires to begin delivery in 3 to 4 minutes in cardiac arrest. 
if gestational age is less than 20 weeks, need not be considered because it won't be that much effective. As far as gestational age between 20 and 24 weeks, resuscitation of mother with this uh, delivery will be much useful for both chances of survival of, uh, 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 we have not to worry for survival of uh, infant, but we have to consider mother. If gestational age more than 24 weeks, then perform to save both life, mother and infant. And as far as principles, of successful CS delivery is concerned. Rapid incision, rapid delivery, and rapid closure. Best obtained with bold midline vertical incision is ideal for rapid delivery. Classical uterine incision, closure with large running suture in a single layer, and no need to shift in OT, no need to scrub abdomen, no need to administer an anesthesia. CS will be comparatively bloodless since there is no cardiac output and chest compression and ventilation should be continued with this delivery part also. Try to resuscitate neonate and hand it over to neonologist if available. Placenta is to be removed by cord traction or MRP. If mother is resuscitated and pulses return, then shift her to ICU immediately and start broad spectrum antibiotic in this type of situation. And the short interval between mother's arrest and infant's delivery is the secret of success in this type of situation. No sustained pre-arrest hypoxia in mother, no sign of fetal distress before mother's cardiac arrest, an aggressive and effective resuscitation effort for mother, and delivery is performed in medical center with NICU. So these are some areas which may improve our result, and ultimately we may save fetus as well as mother also. So to conclude, as far as summary is concerned, always look around and check if the scene is safe. You do not want to become one of the victim. This is for roadside problem and if you are rescuing somebody, then you should quickly look for that. Check responsiveness, open airways, if needed use endotracheal tube 0.5 to 1 mm smaller in internal diameter because due to edema, due to pregnancy, it is required smaller size of tube. Check breathing, look, listen and feel. If breathing, recover, uh, recover the position, manage for health, shifting for teamwork, ambulance, etc. If no breathing, give two effective breaths, assess for 10 seconds only for signs of circulation, look for carotid. If circulation presents, continue rescue breathing, check circulation every minute. If no circulation, compression of chest is uh, the required things and at the rate of 100 per minute, 30 to 2 ratio for compression and breathe. Do not bend your elbows because Thank it could be effective one. Gravid uterus more than 22 weeks uh, also limits the effectiveness of chest compression. Uterus may be shifted away from inferior vena cava and aorta by pulling uh, uterus to the side by assistant. This may be accompanying manually or by placement of a roll blanket or other object under right hip or lumen uh, area. Successful resuscitation of a pregnant woman and survival of fetus require prompt and excellent CPR with some modifications in technique. Defibrillation and medication dosage used for resuscitation of pregnant women are the same as they are used in other adults also. Rescuers should be considered the need for emergency cesarean section delivery as soon as pregnant woman develops cardiac arrest. Rescuers should be prepared to proceed if resuscitation is not successful within three to four minutes. And best survival rate for infant more than 28 weeks occurs when delivery of infant occurs within less than five minutes after mother's heart stop breathing. And as far as this obstetric collapse part is concerned, these are the possible outcomes. Mother and baby die or brain damage, mother and baby intact, mother intact, baby die or intact, mother brain damage and baby intact, and family take legal action 
against hospital anesthesiologist and obstetrician in this type of situation. And when, in spite of all our efforts, if patient is no more, then how to declare bad news? It requires one more separate lecture. Involvement of rush team, death certificate, post-mortem examination, involvement of police. But as far as this litigation part is concerned, usually in court of law, whenever you are facing this type of situation, when you have dealt with obstetric collapse, then the question asks, was it preventable? Whichever happened as far as obstetric collapse happened, was it preventable? And if you cannot say no, then what did you do to prevent it? Why you couldn't prevent it? In spite of all your care and caution, if you couldn't prevent uh, obstetric collapse, then this question will be asked. And did you diagnose well in time it was collapse? And did you manage way in which any prudent doctor would have managed? If you can answer all those questions after dealing this type of cases, then you could be out of legal problem. But in this situation, we have to practice foreseeability, that is anticipation, good communication, consent, and proper documentation, and you may be simply sail through. As far as anticipation is concerned, law expects from us to anticipate certain condition. Uh, say, for example, if we are dealing with a case of central placenta previa, and if, uh, 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 if we are uh, working in a very remote area and where uh, blood facility is not there, it may end up into PPH, it may end up into massive hemorrhage and shock. So we should anticipate this type of condition and we have to counsel for the same and then we have to manage uh, this type of cases at proper place. And records are always at your rescue. So whatever you have done for that very patient to save life of patient, so keep your records up to date. What was done, nothing was neglected, given treatment fully met with standard, demanded by law and ethics. And it should be easily acceptable when offered in the court. So documentation is secret of success. And again, to control, please endorse my candidature for post of President Foxy election year 2024. With regards, salute to all. And again, thank you to Dr. Sneha and Dr. Monica in particular for inviting me to share my views about the subject. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please do not assume. Please ask if any query, any question, if time and chairperson permits. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. That was a very enlightening session. And uh, since we still have two more talks to complete, I think we will keep the questions at the end, sir. Next, yeah. I invite Professor J.B. Sharma from Ames Delhi to deliver his talk and to chair this session. We have none other than Dr. Jairani Kamraj, ma'am, from Chennai, sure. managing sure. company sure. OGSSI. And I would request, madam, to chair the last two talks, please. Thank you, Monica. Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the ICOG team for giving me this opportunity to chair this session on this day. And a very special thanks to Sneha and Monica for your dynamic, I mean, uh, conveying all the presentations in a beautiful way, in a well-organized way. That's up to you. And I'm here and very honored and proud to present and uh, introduce the speaker, Dr. Tevi Sharma, sir, who is the professor of AMC Ames, Delhi. And sir is the proud recipient of BCA Award 2015. And sir is a proud receiver who has won the Indian Council of Medical Research Amrit Modi Unicam Prize for his research uh, in anemia during pregnancy. And he has done more than 350 index journal presentations and also presented over 2,000 papers and uh, shared many, many sessions in the various national and international conferences. He has awarded very many times, many times by RCOG. And he has edited many books. And we are very, very proud and honored to have you, sir, to talk on a very important topic that the general injuries during the obstetric obstetric practice. And we all know the vaginal as well as the abdominal delivery. We encounter a lot of urogenital injuries, which is very common. And identifying the problem is very important so that we can give the women a good quality of life. And we have here. Uh, none other than sir who could be talking on a very important topic in the obstetric practice uh, over to you sir to deliver your lecture on urogenital injuries in obstetrics 
Thank you very much, ma'am, for your kind introduction, and a special thanks to Sneha, ma'am, for inviting me and whole ICUG. So, straight away, I think yes. people are getting late. I start my study. Thank you for the introduction. So, you are dental injury and obstetrics, and we have wonderful lectures and forces delivery, ventures delivery, and all. So, all of them can cause actually uh, uh, trauma to the genital tract. So, because of close embryon embryonic development and anatomical proximity of urinary genital tract, they can get in injured during obstetrics. Almost seventy five percent injuries are basically atrogenic in gynae surgery, but many are occurring in obstetrics also. And uh, rate of urinary tract injury in pelvic surgery... Can you put in a slideshow uh, mode, sir? Okay. It's oh, coming on. Uh, oh. It's on a... Uh... Okay. Oh, sorry, slides. Okay. No, you have to go for the slideshow. Yes, slide yes. Show. Oh, can you see now? Yeah, yeah right. Okay. That's good, sir. Yes, okay. So, rate of urinary tract injury in pelvic surgery is 0.3 to 1%. Bladder injury is more than uretric injury. And 50% are diagnosed in the operative, 50% in the post-operative period. Previous cesarean section is a very significant risk factor. Adhesions, distorted anatomy, inexperienced surgeon, obstructed labor. In normal labor, bladder gets displaced upwards and anterior vaginal wall, bladder, base and urethra are compressed between the fetal head and posterior surface of sympathesis pubis. So in obstructed labor, then they, it, this area can give way and patient can come with a, can develop a psychogenal fistula on 7th or 10th day. And rupture uterus then, where the rupture line involves the anterior vaginal wall, integrity of the bladder and the distal part is reached and the, the, there is a close relationship between the two. And then there can be less risk of genital tract if lacerina is extending to broad ligament or cordly involving vagina, cervix, ureter can be involved. Then placenta accreta spectrum surgery is quite often because bladder is also involved or we are trying to separate bladder from that. So their bladder injuries are very common, especially placenta in creta and per creta. Then difficult operative delivery can also cause injury to the bladder. Accidental incision uh, posterior, uh, posterior bladder wall while uh, doing cesarean section sometimes by accidentally we can injure the bladder. And lower, uh, during lower segment cesarean section or repair of rupture uterus, again, it can go into the bladder or uh, inadvertently stitches may come into the bladder. So in the bladder injury, during primary cesarean section is about 0.2%, but during repeat cesarean, it is about 0.6%. And it is a uh, bladder injury can intraperitoneal, most common site is dome of bladder. And uh, generally in cesarean section, 0.08 to 0.94%. In hysterectomy, 0.1 to 2.5%. In abdominal malignant surgery, uh, risk of injury can be 2.37%. Laparoscopic radical hysterectomy uh, is higher, 4.19 to 4.59%, especially in the initial phase of uh, laparoscopic surgeries. This is yeah, European guidelines uh, uh, data. So the risk factors are prolonged labor, pregnancy with scarred uterus like myomectomy, metroplasty, repair, uterine perforation, abortion, etc. Suspected intra-abdominal adhesions, post-operative pregnancy, then chronic inflammatory disease, malignancy, irradiation, etc. Distorted local anatomy like cervical, lower segment, fibroid, urogenital system anomaly, second stage cesarean section, cesarean hysterectomy. All these are risk factors for injury to the blood and ureter. As per American College Association for Surgery of Trauma, the injuries can be grade 1 where there is contusion and intramural hematoma or partial thickness laceration. But if there is extra peritoneal bladder wall laceration, and, but less than 2 cm, it is grade 2. More than 2 cm extra peritoneal or less than 2 cm interperitoneal, then it is grade 3. And any intraperitoneal bladder wall laceration is more than 2 cm, grade 4. Intra or extra peritoneal bladder wall laceration involving the trigone is the grade 5. So, atrogenic bladder injuries uh, uh, detection is very, very important. So, intraoperative when we are doing any surgery, basically, if there is hematuria, always suspect that there can be bladder injury. Then there can be visible laceration on the bladder, visible bladder catheter, uh, it should not be normally seen, Bla blood or gas in the urine bag during laparoscopy, retrograde bladder filling with or without methylene blue dye, cystoscopy if bladder profession is close to the trigone. It may also be detected by inability to distend the bladder or low return of irrigation fluid. Then in post-operative phase immediately, hematuria, abdominal pain, abdominal distension, ileus, peritonitis, sepsis, urine leak, uh, decreased urine output, increased serum creatinine, vesicogenal or vesicotine fistula. So all these show that patient had iatrogenic bladder injury during the procedure. 
how to prevent it that while doing any surgery, cesarean section or any other surgery, we should empty the bladder by urethral catheterization before the surgery and we can leave the catheter like we, I, as a general principle, I leave the catheter in situ. Sharp dissection if adhesion. So never do blunt dissection. It is at that time, especially in previous cesarean section, that bladder can be injured or opened. So sharp dissection is always better. Be careful with use of cautery and be intrafacial in approach. If diagnosed intraoperatively, it should be repaired immediately followed by uh, bladder drainage for 7 to 14 days. The key principle of bladder repair is inadequate mobilization for tension-free tissue repair. Closure should be uh, complete with delayed absorbable suture. I routinely use 3-0 vicryl for uh, first layer and 2-0 vicryl for the second layer. And bladder wall can be closed in one or two layers using either running or interruptive stitches. I take uh, like a running stitch for the first and interruptive stitch for the second layer and 3-0 vicryl. So this is how the bladder hole is injured, uh, repaired basically. The epithelium and bladder wall are closed as a first layer, which we can do as a continuous layer. And then closure of second or seromuscular layer. And peritoneum is also closed with the cystostomy repair. So then it can become three-layered repair. If there is a late presentation post-op diagnosis, then most common complaint will be constant urinary drainage per vaginum. So small pinpoint fistula uh, cause intermittent wetness, which is positional in nature, especially during standing position. Then urine dermatitis, foul ammoniacal odor, vulval and crustaceans, and amenorrhea in 12 to 15 percent if fistula duration is more than one year. Uh, on post-op imaging, CT cystography is procedure of choice, and ultrasound interperitoneal fluid or extraperitoneal collection can be seen, but it is not sufficient for diagnosis. That can only go in, uh, like, you can just warn you, but better do, do CT cystography. Then cystoscopy for bladder wall integrity, trigone injury, and any ureteric injury. So management will depend upon the site, type and severity of injury. If defects are less than 2 mm, they can be managed expectantly by leaving catheter for like 1 to 2 weeks. Very small injury, less than 1 cm, either be repaired or bladder catheter placed for 5 to 7 days. And then repeat cystogram to confirm closure. If more than 1 cm, then cystostomy repair has to be done. Risk of failure of primary bladder repair is large extraperitoneal injury more than 2 cm, intraperitoneal bladder injury, bladder neck injury, trigone injury, and uh, they all have to be stitched. And failure rate of primary bladder repair is 18% subsequent VVF may be there. If they are ureteric injuries, they can uh, occur as we can see on the right hand side. Emergency here in section 0 0.01 to 0 0.05, uh, vaginal 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 percent, abdominal 0 0.03 to 2, laparoscopic 0.13 to 6 percent. So higher in laparoscopic surgery, especially in the initial phase of training. And you use gynecological surgery 1.7 to 4.3 percent. But they can occur like in cesarean section also. So has close attachment to peritoneum, variable course. And not, not easily delineated, identification of ureter is important. Pale glistening appearance, peristalsis, snap filling when pressed between two fingers, longitudinal vessels on the surface. So this is how we can diagnose that ureteric injury has occurred. In this slide, we can just see all types, all the ureter starting from the abdominal and then going into the pelvis. You can see it is crossing the bifurcation of the uh, common eyelid and then going in the pelvis. Okay, and same way, these are the area where it can be injured. So, dorsal to infundopelvic ligament, it the, in fact, some people these days feel that commonest injury, I, when we were students, we used to be taught that it occurs in the near uh, ureter, ureteric, uh, near the uterine artery, because ureter is just 1.25 to 1.5 centimeter behind the uh, uh, this uh, uterine artery. Water always flows under the bridge, that's what we teach. But recent uh, studies say that in fundopelvic ligament, at that place, uh, the injury, commonest uh, site of injury is there. Then the tunnel of dime and intermural portion of the ureter. So these are the four places where injury can happen. And commonest, I told you, are one either uh, at the uh, uh, uterine artery and in fundopelvic ligament. So crushing injury with clamp can ca cause necrosis, then transaction, complete or partial, ligature, suture or linear stapler, angulation with secondary obstruction, kinking, partial or complete, ischemia, stripping of adventitia, segmental section, and then thermal burns, diathermy, mono, more than bipolar, and laser energy. So these are the grades of ureteric injury as according to American Association. Grade 1 is hematoma, grade 2 laceration, grade 3 laceration more than 50% transaction, grade 4 laceration complete transaction with less than 2 cm, grade 5 laceration avulsion with more than 2 cm of devascularization and advanced 1 grade if multiple uh, lesions exist. 
So presentation can be immediate post op up to four weeks, depending on the site of injury, type of injury. Signs seem to include flank abdominal pain, abdominal distension, low grade fever, nausea, vaginal leak of urine and voluntary micturition. Then examination is per speculum. Collect uh, when we do speculation, we can see the urine there, and or creatinine is more than ten milligram on that. And three swab test uh, has been done. Upper most swab will be basically wet but not colored. Tampoon again can also tell us. And then investigation will be urine routine culture, ultrasound KUV area, will show hydro-uterine necrosis if there is uh, obstruction. Cystoscopy and urinary catheterization can be done. IVP will tell us vaginal opacification occurs before post word image in case of uh, fistula. And retrograde urethrospilography can tell us at which place the urinary uh, uh, injury is, has occurred. CT urography again is also complained. So principle of repair are uretric and speculation more than one centimeter, uretric mobilization for tension free uh, repair and use fine 4050 absorbable sutures. Avoid reimplantation of ureter, this is mobile, will we'll cause this uretric stenosis and usually for uretric injury we call our uh, colleagues from urology department. Interoperative identification and immediate repair, post-op identification repair as soon as possible unless infection or other comorbidities are present within three to five days. So generally, if we detect it in one first uh, two to three days, we do it immediately. Later on, we do it at some time. And then we need to identify it at uh, either by direct visualization or interoperative cystoscopy or peristalsis is not a very poor, uh, good method actually. So ap what is the preventive method? Appropriate operative approach, adequate exposure, adequate mobilization of bladder, avoid blind clamping of vessels, uretic dissection and short diathermy application. So this is due to reduce ureter peristalsis in the third trimester from hypoperfusion and they can be hypotension and ongoing loss. So high degree of suspicion and specific vigilance is required. So preventive measures are naturally ad interoperatively adequate exposure of the site where ureters are susceptible. Ureter integrity should be checked. If injury is suspected inoperatively, dye, can be done, dye test can be done. And resistance to cystoscopy passive of retrograde urethral catheterization and on-table retrograde pyelography can also be done via cystoscope. And during post or peripartum hysterectomy, uh, especially for pass, sound operative techniques should be used. Visualization of the aerator should be done as prophylactic stenting uh, may have to be required. Not all, but sometimes. During serious action, the second stage of labor, when the head of the fetus is there, a traumatic fetal delivery to prevent less session of urethra and incision should be done. And identification of the urethra after surgery should be done. And preference for partial or subtotal total serious stenting by less experienced surgeon. So in, uh, the steps will be identify ureter on middle leaf of peritoneum, palpate external uh, iliac artery, place index finger over ureter with clamping in while clamping in front of pelvic ligament. As a whole, when I'm doing, uh, putting clamp on the pelvic ligament, I lift the ovary and I put the clamp as close to ovary as possible. If you lift the ovary and tubes actually, uh, infundopelic ligament is also lifted up, but ureter goes uh, back a bit and put the clamp as close to ovary as possible. Educate medical mobilization of bladder and ureter is followed towards cardinal ligament where it passes under the uterine artery. And then the lateral and downward traction, moving it away from the cervix with traction on uterus to expose uterine artery. Ureters are protected as uterine vessels are ligated. So we stay close to the uterus while clamping uterine vessels. Management will be if there is ureteric ligation, suture should be released and stent should be placed. If partial ligation, primary repair, then an uncomplicated upper middle ureter ureterostormy can be done or ureteral ileal interposition, lower third ureteral neocystostomy, and sometimes with bori flap also we do it, that means implanted in the bladder only. Uh, ureteral ureteral anastomosis actually has tends to cause constriction at that area, so we lower part we avoid that. Thermal injury section of the part has to be done. So this is how ureteral ureterostomy is done with the 5060 vitreal, and uh, we put a stent also on that. This is the trans ureteral ureter, ureterostomy. So in this case, basically, instead of side end to end, side to side uh, uh, implantation of the ureter is done. And this is the ureteral neocystostomy. So preferably, we should try to bring ureter to the bladder uh, using bori flap and all. Sometimes you can say this, this is the bori flap. That means because the length of the ureter is less, so we need to bring make a bori flap with the upper part of the bladder and then put the uh, so that uh, ureter is implanted into this bori flap. Then uh, uh, this polyterno lead better intracycle technique for ureter uh, uh, neostostomy can also be done. And bori flap I have already said. And then ureteric ileal interposition sometimes can be done as well. So this is my last slide. So bladder injury should be suspected uh, at the time of surgery and should be repaired. And uh, leave the catheter for 10 to 14 days. Ureter injury also should be uh, repaired at the same site 
and so the penalty is just to complete though it doesn't come directly in and the instance so so you can say my obstetric risk factors are there so we know grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 grade 4 sphincter tears and grade 3 to 4 need actually uh, stitching under general anesthesia and operation theater so grade 3 a less than 50% external uh, sphincter grade 3 b more than 50% grade 3 c internal sphincter is also there. So this has to be stitched at the same time in that during surgery only we identify it and we stitch it uh, like two, uh, two, two zero or one zero OSS also called obstetric anal sphincter. This is how we it is. So we stitch with uh, anal mucosa three zero rest PDS or two zero for it. I tend to use two zero vehicle for that. And so anal rectal mucosa internal anal sphincter is in the wall of the rectum only. External anal sphincter we need to catch on both sides and stitch it on both sides with using uh, side to side technique or, or overlapping technique that is how you can see both have equally good results so this is how and the results are quite good so that's and post op we need to follow up them after three months to make sure that there is no incompleteness in the surgery and next time we it's better to do lactic serine section and uh, for these patients so and we need to prevent uh, by using ritual maneuver perineal sport perineal massage I went to more than forceps. So take home message, failure to recognize an injury at the time of surgery uh, falls below the standard uh, of a reasonable gynae surgeon and we, they can be uh, basically court cases. Injury must be repaired when diagnosed intraoperatively. Like litigation rates can be high, 56% for option gynae complications. And we heard Dr. M.C. Patel, he had done a lot of work on uh, medical legal this thing. So this is an area, complete penalty, uretric injury, where medical legal cases can be there. So in the court also, when you go, they say, you know, making a uretric injury, bladder injury is not a sin, but not detecting and uh, re repairing it is a, uh, is a, like that way can be a sin that way. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, wonderful narration on this. Uh, erogenic injuries and obstetric practice. You have talked everything right from the causes, how we can identify what are the protective measures and management. Everything you have put in a very composite manner for anyone to understand easily and uh, give in their, uh, in their uh, knowledge way they can learn from this. So thank you so much, sir, for uh, being with us. Sneha, yeah. anything you want to add? Yes, thank you so much, uh, JB, sir. And coming it's straight from the man. Can't say no to you, man. Yes. You are a friend, personal friend. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. My regard for all yeah. of Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So, we will be moving on to the next session. Yes. Uh, yes. I have a great pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Narendra Char, who is the present uh, Joint Treasurer of Foxy 2021-24. And, sir, is the Professor and HOD of uh, LTEM Medical College, Dubai. And he will be now talking on a very important and interesting topic that the difficulties we face in the cesarean section, every oxidation. Really want to know about how they feel when they land into an obstetric uh, in, in the exercise section, the complications. And uh, we are here to hear from you, sir, about it. Thank you so much for inviting me for this ICOG course on high risk pregnancy. And the topic today is difficulties in cesarean section. I would like to share my slides now. Yes, sir, you can share the slides. Yes, thank you. Can you see me? Hi, sir. Yes, we can see yours. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, do I access this now? One minute. So we can see your video only, sir. Can you see my video? Yeah, we can see only your video only. We are not seeing your PPT. Okay, sorry. I think I have opened another one. Sorry. So now can you see me? Yeah, yes, sir. Okay. The PPT is seen now. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So thank you, Dr. Sneha Bhuyar, and thank you, Dr. Monika Singh. Uh, it was a pleasure to meet you in Varanasi, Kashi, and also at various uh, other conferences. Today, my topic is difficulties in cesarean section. 
and I welcome all the delegates to this certificate course on emergency obstetric. I am a professor in Cyan Hospital. Cyan Hospital comes uh, and serves the largest slum area of Asia, that is Dharavi, and it is situated uh, between the Eastern Express Highway and Western Express Highway. And fortunately, I am a professor there since last 34 years. I started my post-graduation and uh, that was in 91. And today we are in 2024. So I have gone through three decades of my life serving poor people. And uh, it's a government and a municipal hospital. I get students from all over India. And I'm honored and privileged that I am able to give my contribution in this journey of as Dr. Niranjan Chawan. So in the middle of difficulty lies opportunity. And every opportunity, I take it as a challenge. And even if it is difficulty, I come over through the obstacles which you all also face in this difficult caesarean section. So now let's go back to the history of caesarean section. And uh, there is a confusion about the history. Some people believe that Julius Caesar was born through this method. Others believe that during the Numa Pompilis era, there was a law which was passed as Lex Regia and then it became Lex Caesarea. And it specified that a baby should be born in a mother who is dying or dead and she cannot be buried with a baby in her womb. And this was then published in Jack's William book, 1598. And the term was introduced section and it replaced the word operation. This is the pictorial diagrammatic representation of how a baby has been born by cutting up the dead body of a woman. And then this baby is given to the relatives if it is alive or it is buried separately from the mother but besides her. Now, my topic is difficulty in access of a, a caesarean section. We have many cases which come up for previous LSES, one LSES, two LSES, and we have difficulty in abdominal access. We have difficulty in uterine incision. There are various additions which we can come across starting from the skin to the subcute to the rectus sheet and to the peritoneum. And people have opened bladder, people have opened bowel, people have walked in and try to search a baby in the bladder and water has come and that is actually urine. It's a previous classical caesarean section. There could be difficulty of a patient with placenta previa or placenta accreta. But I'm not going to dwell into the topic of placenta spectrum disorders. There are fibroids which are also coming in the way or either after delivery you need to do a myomectomy and there are, of course, uterine anomaly, a septum being there in the center of the uterus. It could be partial or complete, or it could be a rudimentary horn of the uterus or a bicornuate uterus, etc. Then the most important thing is difficulty in fetal delivery. How much ever you are trained as an obstetrician and as a person in an emergency uh, uh, setup, you have always a difficulty and you have difficulties not only in the lie, in the position, but also in delivering them and the technique of delivering. People have, uh, you know, broken the cavicle. People have also broken the humerus while delivering a transverse lie or a breach. And of course, uh, I have certain videos which I will show as we go through my lecture. So difficult abdominal access is because of the surgery which has been done in the past and there is a difficulty. So first we should understand that what is the type of incision? I have seen that some of the resident doctors who are training under us at Cyan Hospital and when they come back, they give the incision very low near the pubis symphysis. So that should not be the thing. You should have at least two fingers above the pubis symphysis, the primary section. And penicillin incision is the best 
And if you have uh, two or three incisions and you are a little worried that if you enter through that incision and you are going to walk in into the bladder or there is going to be a plastered bladder on the anterior surface of the uterus, then it's always better to do a Joel Cohen based method or a Maillard incision little higher up. And in worst scenario, vertical incision, but it is not practiced nowadays. Well, there is something like scar excision and you can do it at the end of the procedure or in the beginning where you elliptically cut out the scar and take it out so that you do not have a fibrotic uh, edges and they heal faster. Well, there are certain special care which we have to be taken and uh, which we have to take and especially when you're opening to the, uh, you know, the walls of the abdominal wall and just sliding into the upper aspect of the incision. So you have a financial incision, but when you have the upper flap and the lower flap being created, you need to walk in at the highest point entering into the peritoneum. Never enter the abdominal cavity to the lower point because there if it is a plastered uh, bladder onto the anterior abdominal wall or if it is a, uh, you know, uh, the bladder is totally not evacuated. Unfortunately, people have walked into the bladder or they have walked into the bowel. So you have to be very careful. You don't want to do those same mistakes when others have done it. You can see others doing, you can uh, uh, see them in the conferences or you can see in the lectures mm -hmm. or uh, uh, you can hear it, but we don't want to be a part of it. So try to avoid as much as possible. And then there are adhesions which are there, uh, which are not preventable. The response of the adhesion formation varies with each and every patient. And uh, so these are the types of the uterine incision. Once you walk in into the abdominal cavity, you open up, put the doins, put the C-shaped retractors and have a good vision and see that the bladder is pushed down if it is stuck up. And if it is really plastered anteriorly, Try to push it down as much as possible, but don't walk in and into the bladder. Then you take a classical incision. There is nothing to worry or a little a higher uh, lower segment transverse incision or a vertical incision. So you have incisions which are difficult and that could be intraperitoneal adhesions. Bladder is adherent to the lower uterine segment as I discussed now. And if it is a previous classical cesarean, so in section uterine anomaly or a fibroid, we need to understand then then dense intraperitoneal adhesions are there. If the uterus is totally plastered, and you, as I said, have to open the peritoneum high up. Now you can take two arteries and feel the peritoneum and open and cut it in between. Or I usually try to put an artery and open and open and boating. I use my fingers. My fingers are sharper like knives or they are sharper like scissors. So I just walk in in there and I try to do such type of surgeries as far as possible. So important pointer while tackling adhesions are to stay close to the uterus, go higher up when you are opening the abdominal cavity and you open the uterus between stay sutures or you uh, avoid the bladder and that is the safest thing what you can do. Now, there are few videos, so I would request that my time be extended because that is the last lecture of mine. So, I want to give practical tips here. This is this video which is there. It's a previous LSE. As you can see, it is so much stuck up there. And uh, you have to separate and pull out, uh, you know, push the bladder down. I want to play it again. I think it was a very small video, but you can have a look here. There is a thick band of adhesion. You can see like a bladder pillar there and it has been cut and then that's how you have to proceed. So not every time the fingers will be helping you. Bladder adherent to the uterine Lower uterine segment is 0.08 to 0.94 percent. Bladder gets adherent and it should be incised in such a case at least two centimeter above the bladder. So the UV fold could be mobilized with a finger or a swab. Now I always use a, a scissor to cut the UV fold. 
and uh, you have to use the forceps and then you have to direct it in a smiley incision and if there are adhesions the bladder has to be pushed down so you have to understand at least two to three centimeter you should be above where the bladder and the uterus have stuck together now this is the video i have taken today this is a little elaborate and a better uh, quality of video so i have to this is the primary section you, you need to open with a nick and then open the scissor and then that's how you go ahead and cut the part here. Similarly, you also have to go from the center and go on to the left hand side. Okay. Now, once you have done this, this is the most important thing I'll tell you. This is the basic thing. Doing scissoring section, I ask my residents who come as SR from other medical colleges, they come to train under me. And they tell me how many sections, I mean, I ask them how many sections, they say I have done 200 sections. One lady told me I have done 2000 sections, but when I see them operating, they, uh, you know, uh, it is a very mutilating surgery I see, or, uh, uh, you know, there is no finasse, there is no tissue sense. So you should have some tissue sense, respect to the tissues. As you proceed to do a gynecological surgery, which is bloodless, even a cesarean section should be bloodless. And this is the upper flap you need to separate out. And this is the lower flap also you need to separate out. And once that is done, uh, 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 the bladder has to be pushed down. I usually prefer to use a mop because mop is not going to open the bladder. Or I use fingers. I do not uh, try to push it with a swab. You might be using the swab to push it down. But this is the best way I prefer to do. And there are now flimsy adhesions. There are uh, rather the fascia is there here it is a primary section so there are no additions i would like to correct here and then to advance the dorins and before you make an incision onto the lower uterine segment you have to understand that you have to feel the presenting part and ballot whether it is engaged whether it is fixed deeply impacted or it is floating because on that basis only you will take the incision further otherwise you will miss the part you will take an incision onto the lower uterine segment and you will find that the shoulder or the shoulder is coming out or the hand is coming out. That means your incision is little higher up and this is a deeply impacted head. So you need to understand, find out where is the head and then take the incision. But see that the bladder is at least two to three centimeter below your incision so that you avoid any direct injury to the bladder or you do not cause any, even if there is an extension of the left side, uterine artery or there is colporex, it doesn't go to the base of the bladder. Now uterine anomaly, here you can see the right horn, the left horn and the baby is in one horn. Well, this is the bicornuate uterus, but you need to have a good recognition on the ultrasound and uh, lateral extension of the uterine incision should be watched here because here the uterus is divided into two and the lower uterine segment is very small. You need to also mop and cure it out and see if there is any septum that's usually commonly seen in a breach or a transverse lie. Leomyoma, as I said, it is found in 0.3 to 7.2 percent during pregnancy. And in such cases, you can remove the leomyoma, preferably provided it is in the incision of the lower segment or, or it is in such a way that it doesn't cause a lot of excessive bleeding. So previously when we started, we used to tell not to remove the leomyoma and it will shrink on its own and forget about it. But no, nowadays we are quite have uh, daring and you can do a, a myomectomy at the same sitting, however, how much big it is, but see that blood is arranged, a proper consent and informed consent is taken and be ready for the worst uh, situation if there is a excessive blood loss. So all these things have to be taken into consideration. Now, difficulty in fetal delivery is the most thing. Vertex presentation, you can go ahead and deliver, but there is a transverse lie. Here you find that the head is on the one lumbar side and the, or the left or the right and the other op opposite side is the buttocks. The spine could be lower or the, the, the it could be dorsal superior or dorsal inferior. 
So the whole idea is that when you cut open the lower uterine segment, you are not going to feel the fetal head. You are just going to feel something uh, like a rib cage or you are going to feel something like a shoulder there. But you need to go and try to deliver the breech first or try to get hold of the one of the feet. And that feet has to be hold between the index and the middle finger at the, 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 the ankle and like a cigarette butt. And then one, it is pulled out. The second one is also come, coming out with it. And then you deliver the buttocks, the trunk and the further shoulders and lastly the face and the head. So this is how you may have to do it. And in that case, if there is a difficulty or a large baby with a transverse lie, you might have to vertically extend the incision like an inverted T-shape in rare occasions. But see that there is no injury to the baby and at the same time, there is no lateral extension. So whether it is a preterm labor, it is a full-term labor or an obstetric labor, you have to understand that each and every aspect of this labor has to be tackled differently. Because in preterm labor with the transverse lie, the lower uterine segment is thick and very vascular and that bleeding is going to irritate you when you are trying to go and search for the buttocks. So you have to do a proper incision in a full term. The lower uterine segment is very well formed and you can take a lower segment incision and do the breast, uh, breech extraction. Well, obstructed labor, it could be because it's totally neglected transverse lie. I recollect 20 years back ago from a private or a peripheral maternity hospital, we used to get such cases where they had been put on pitocin drip and they used to come here with a hand prolapse and the baby's hand is shaking hand with you and the vagina is very hot. The babies are in IUFD and you have an obstructed labor. In that case, uh, probably the baby is dead and you have to take an incision. You might... Uh, and we have done, our seniors also have done decapitation, evisceration, etc. But not nowadays to be done in the present situation. Well, so as I said, if it is a dorsal superior, the back is up, the transverse lie, you deliver at a foot length breach. Consequently, a vertical incision or an inverted T-shape incision may be required and uh, you can deliver this. So now I'm showing you a transverse lie with an IUFD. All these videos are available on YouTube and uh, this is an older video so it is little blurred and the baby is already dread. It is a preterm baby. We had tried to deliver it vaginally but uh, she had already passed more than 48 hours and there is a chance of infection. So this is how we have cut and we have opened the lower uterine segment. You have stretched it. Either you can stretch or you can open with scissor and once that is done how we are trying to find out where is the buttocks or where is, um, uh, you know, what things comes out. So you have to be very careful. Yes, now you can see that the hand has been introduced inside. Suctioning is constantly done and it is coming in our way. The suction tube we cannot see. And here you can see that the baby's buttock has come out. Then one limb flaccid and the second one the trunk and then the fetal head has come out with the shoulders. So this is a dead baby of a transverse life. So always go for the buttocks. Now deeply impacted head, as I said, you can see that uh, it is a, a deep transverse arrest or it is a prolonged labor and there is a persistent occipital posterior. You have to understand that now this baby is totally impacted. There is hardly any space. When you do a PV examination, the on PV examination, the dilatation of the cervix is probably 8 to 10 centimeters, well effaced. There is a capote, there is a molding and the occiput is either at 3 o'clock or at 9 o'clock position or it is a persistent occipital posterior position and this baby needs to be delivered by a section and it is not coming down and in that case you have to do an emergency section. So... Uh, this can complicate about 1.5% of cesarean deliveries. As I said, it is a prolonged second stage and failed attempt. Even people have attempted a forceps or a ventus and they have then reverted back for a cesarean section. But you remember that there is a high chance of the baby or the fetus and the infant having uh, intracranial hemorrhage or, and all the different types of fracture or asphyxia. And that also increases the risk of maternal complication with uterine laceration 
cervical tear and damage to the uterine vessel and even to the bladder. So, so excuse we, me, sir, we are running short of time. What we need so to I... do is we practice. There are two, three methods, but what we practice here is, uh, uh, you know, the assistant introduces the two finger and the legs are wide open and the fetal head is pushed up so that you break up the air, the vacuum, which is created between the cervix and the fetal head and you push the fetal head. And so that when the operator, the, the, the performer can introduce his hand and hold the fetal head. He gets a good grip, push it up, and then uh, you can just deliver her with a mother's legs being abducted. And this also can be performed. Now, Patwardhan Shukar, those technique is the wonderful sir, technique. And I have seen the RCOG record and other people are also trying to uh, uh, showcase the Patwardhan Manu all over the world. I don't know how many of you have tried, but it is commonly tried in the western part of India, especially in Maharashtra and in other parts of the country where people and the residents have come here and undergone this training and they have gone back. So here you need to understand that here it's a deeply impacted head. And the first thing what when you take an incision above the two or three centimeters of the bladder, when you are posted down, the anterior shoulder comes out and that is then uh, you can't push it in. You can't even access the uh, fetal head. So you have to allow the anterior shoulder, then rotate the fetus and remove out the posterior shoulder, then the fetal trunk, the breech and the lower limbs. And then subsequently, uh, you have to do all this maneuverability. And then the head is lifted out of the pelvis in the same manner as a reverse breech extraction. Well, Dr. Patwardhan is a pioneer. And uh, this is his picture. I don't know how many of you have seen, but he was a wonderful person and he has taught this technique to all of us. And we have carried out that legacy of doing it. So uh, the other option is a modified Patwardhan technique where you take out the baby, the anterior shoulder, then the corresponding lower limb, then the opposite lower limb, and then the contral and then the uh, posterior shoulder. So it it goes uh, clockwise manner. Sure. This is a modified yeah, the modified treatment. So this is the diagrammatic picture where you can see. I request to mute whoever is talking. Thank you so sir, much. Sir, I am the chat person speaking here, sir. I see what you are doing. This is also a, a presentation, a video. I would request you to have a look at this. Once we have opened this, uh, open this right. Yes, we will just forward this video. And now, once the incision is taken, onto the lower uterine segment. Okay, now you see the, the, the lower limb, right? Yes. And, and uh, this is not sorry, not the lower limb. This is the deep. The one shoulder is taken out. The other shoulder is taken out. And now you have to tug the 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 the, the, the chest, and then you have to pull it out. At the same time, the assistant is trying to force it out, and then the buttocks, and then the baby. You can see it's a meconium stained baby. I will show you again this video. I want you to have a look at this video. Once the incision has been made, we have to have that it's a deeply impacted head. And you can see that one of the shoulder is pulled out. I think this is the right shoulder. Yes, anterior, then the posterior shoulder. Yes, don't break. Don't break the humerus. You have to be very careful. And now you tuck the rib cage and pull this out at the same time the assistant is pushing out and the trunk and keep the back front and then the buttocks come out and then the lower limbs and lastly the fetal head will flop out so this is a very interesting video i wanted to share with you thank you so much well the breech delivery uh, this is also a simple procedure which you can do it is no different from a vaginal breech extraction. Uh, it just a natural range of movement occurs. And the delivery of the after coming head, 
you have to avoid the, the, the trapping and the head retracting the uterus, especially in the premature breach. You have to perform the Morris's mileage with maneuver similar to that of a vaginal breach delivery or maybe a forceps application. Uh, the abdominal and uterine incision should be sufficient and large enough because there should be no trauma to the fetal extraction. You have to have a good hysterotomy incision and it's adequate most to the term or near term. And this is a very interesting video. I would like to share with you a breach delivery in cesarean section. So once you have taken an incision onto the lower uterine segment, of course, you have already palpated it. You can stretch. And now you have to see that you try to find the buttocks. Well, you can't, but I found one lower limb. Yes, I can see the foot. Now it is to be hold like a cigarette butt between the index and the middle finger. You can see and then it is pulled out at the same time the other limb is also hold. And the baby tries to go back but we need to keep it little front. You have to keep it. It slips away. There is always a towel which has to be kept ready because there is vernix caseosa. It will allow not you to have a good grip. And now you pull out, pull out, pull out and then it let it come up till the umbilicus. Then you slide your finger onto the shoulder and then remove the anterior shoulder. See that you do not cause any trauma. The other shoulder is also taken out gradually, very carefully. This baby is quite big. And now you have to deliver this like a... You, you, you can put your smiley's wet maneuver, one finger into the mouth and then uh, take it out. So this is the breech delivery which has been done now. Thank you for watching. And now, extremely low birth weight. These babies are very small. They could be IUGR. They could be preterm. And, uh, well, it could be a thicker myometrium. So, here you have a lot of blood loss. Bleeding is going to occur. So, you have to anticipate that quite commonly. And floating head. Floating head is also commonly seen in such cases when there is a polyhydromnios or there is a, a, a preterm and it is not engaged and the engagement of the head so you have taken an incision little higher up or you just two or three centimeter above the uh, bladder which has been pushed down but the fetal head is not coming in the, uh, the the grip of your hand you're trying to push it down and trying to grasp the fetal head so this is what happens and it needs to be totally hold in the longitudinal lie and steadied with the lateral support, lateral support to the walls and see that the fetal head is old. So here you can use, I prefer to use Vectis. Vectis is the one arm of the forceps. So after amniotomy, the liquor should be drained very slowly. Sudden decompression will cause an accidental hemorrhage. And you have to allow the fetal head to come down to grasp it. And then you can just hold and then try to guide it out through the incision. At the same time, applying fundal pressure is a controversial thing, but well, you decide accordingly. But I have seen people give jhatkas like this. No, never do the fundal pressure. There, uh, there is a probability of uh, uh, controversy here, so that I leave it here open to decide what you would prefer to do. But see that the head is then taken out properly and then it is delivered out. So here a single blade of the forceps can be used and uh, well, in the previously Barton's forceps was used and this is or a vacuum extractor also can be used to deliver the fetal head. Well, we use a vectis. You can decide whether to use a single blade. So you have the left blade and the right blade. You can take the right blade and introduce it through, I mean, the left, the left blade, which is going toward the uh, left side of the fetus. I'm sorry, I want to correct the left blade going this way and the right blade going this way. So you can use both the blades. First you apply the left and the right and then once you have got the grip and the locking has occurred, then you take it out through the incision. Or you can use only one blade and then take it out. This is the pictorial representation of how after the blades are been introduced, the locking has occurred. The locking has occurred between the two years. Remember, you cannot apply onto the face and onto the occiput. It has to be applied this way the, the left blade going down and the right and then locking and then pulling it out. Now, this is a video of one vectis.
So pressure is applied and once you applied, you just allow it to come out and this baby has come out. You can see here it's crying and this is how you can apply with a one blade. So here we could not identify which side is the occiput and all that. Preferably you have to avoid using on the one blade on the face. That is very important. Otherwise you have problems. Now this video is very rare. We had this case about 10 to 12 years back and this was a thoracophagus. In our case, conjoint twins are nowadays very, very rare to be seen. They are 1 in 50,000 to 1 lakh. Probably in 10-15 uh, years back, the ultrasound was also unfortunately missed and this baby had to continue. And uh, more commoner in African and Latin American countries, females are more affected than males. This is a video where we had to... Uh, we had already diagnosed it as a conjoint twins on an ultrasound, so we knew what we are dealing. At the lower uterine segment, you can see it is totally ballooned up, very huge. It's opened up. This was uh, conjoint twins, which we had applied. And then we had to do an inverted T-shape, a vertical incision being taken. And we went ahead and cut. Now, you can see the two heads, which are very close to each other and the thorax being stuck together and here we had to remove each one of the babies, rotate it and then that's how we could take out this conjoint twins babies. You can see they are stuck in the thoracal, thorax region. Unfortunately, these babies could not be operated or they were tried, I can't recollect, but they died unfortunately one month later. So this was the case of conjoint twins. There are various types of conjoint twins you can come uh, well, the, uh, this is just uh, for your theoretical idea, thoracophagus, ompylophagus, ischiophagus, where the ischiums are joined, paraphagus, where one baby is in situ in another one, cephalophagus, where the head is joined together, craniophagus, rachipagus, pyophagus, incidences, percentage, symmetry, asymmetry, and how the fusion is occurred is explained here. Well, this is an elective termination and elective classical caesarean section or an inverted T-shape incision can be taken. Well, so there are other issues also where your inadequate incision, the anesthetist is uh, unfortunately, the patient is not under properly, very tight abdomen. You have difficulty, a wrong abdominal incision, a previous LSE scar, you walk it into some another structure and unfortunately the bladder has opened so all these things you have to be kept in mind and you need to be doing properly most of the time i have seen that there are uterine incision extensions there are tears while removing out the head and i don't know why people are so in a hurry that they are just want to pull out the baby have some tissue sense have some gentleness and then go ahead and i'll tell you not a single extension you will find in your professional career that will unnecessarily waste half an hour and giving her blood, etc. post-operatively. See that the tear is then sutured and see that the bladder is away from it and you have to mobilize the bladder from beginning. Prevention is better than cure. And if it has gone down like a colporexis or a dog ear tear, then you need to go and hold at the apex or take a stay suture and then pull it up. Then at least somewhere you can get the hang of it and then start suturing in a continuous interlocking. But you need to close that from the apex upwards towards the lower flap. So this is the lower flap. This is the extension which has occurred or extension into the lower uterine segment. And then you need to uh, achieve hemostasis. Unfortunately, if the tear is not very sure and it has extended laterally, you might have to uh, open a broad ligament and... Uh, also, the round ligament, if it is spreading laterally to the lateral pelvic wall with a hematoma. Well, then if bleeding is not controlled, then to do systematic devascularization procedure, that's out of the purview of my lecture. Uh, well, you can discuss and see on videos uh, in my YouTube channel. These are the injuries to the fetus. This lecture is incomplete without that. And we have to understand that there, there as I mentioned, there could be a mark on the face. Here you can see the fracture of the clavicle, the lower limb. Here the humerus fracture is seen. So you have to be very careful and deal with. People have complained. The relatives have gone and filed police complaint against the doctor. It's a huge nuisance value. So all these things you have to take care. So the atraumatic delivery is the most important thing for an obstetrician. 
and you have to avoid injuries by not doing any haste and inappropriate and inadequate uterine incision trap the fetal parts or a deep or uncontrolled uterine incision lacerating the fetal parts so always my seniors have taught me to be very safe to be sure of what you are doing you should be swift in your surgery it's at a spinal level just go on doing and be sound in your clinical and surgical skills your knotting techniques have to be proper square knots have to be put do the surgery relentlessly bloodlessly that is most important my mother used to tell me that a obstetrician should have a lady's finger a lion's heart eagle's eye and a good hand dexterity and i would like to add here one more you should have doberman's suspicion always have lateral thinking and think good for the best of the patient this is one article i want to share with you which has come yesterday where we have introduced the cyan model the incidence of cesarean section is going sky high and it is much more in the peripheral hospital or in private and we have started the study from june onwards so we compared the section rate of our unit not of the other units but of our unit till june 2023 and till date now we have used this model and there is a drop of 4 to 5 percent in the incidence of cesarean section today also we had kept one patient for elective lscs but by the time i reached the campus she had already delivered she was a previous lscs and it was because of mechanical dilatation of the cervix with a foley's catheter which was introduced yesterday night and we delivered her vaginally and what more can you ask for a mother delivering vaginally we did survey also on this and we will talk that later on but this is a very important uh, cyan model i would request you if you anyone wants to do this study or anyone wants to deliver your patients vaginally rather than doing cesarean section and there are painless uh, vaginal delivery get back to me and we will surely work on that so difficulties in your life do not come to destroy you but to help you realize your hidden potential and the power and let difficulties know that you too are a difficult person where you can tackle difficulties this is the famous quote by apj abdul kalam i welcome you all to aicog 2025 we had two organizing committee meetings one was on 10th of march myself nandita and rishi we did this organizing committee meeting where 80 members joined us together at the geo world convention center i welcome all of you as members as delegates as faculty and meet professionals from all over the world who are going to land in the city of mumbai which never sleeps and we are all going to wait for you to join you and to deliver you the best aicog ever happened we did it in the past in 2013 and we will do it next year and always suggestions are open heartedly accepted from us from all of us who are going to be a part of this journey and we all welcome you with folded hands this is from 9th of january till 12th of january the whole program is written here it's a standard program which we there and yes mumbai has to be with bollywood and there are going to be anemia amok bharat and there has to be a cervical cancer prevention when dr niranjan chavan is there so i welcome all of you please be there and i again thank dr monika singh dr sneha and all the icog members the chair and we have dr parul kotra wala dr sarita bhaile rao she is my classmate parag binni wale dr mandakini meg and many of you icog governing council members where you have made so much efforts to be there together for this icog online courses they are super duper hit and everyone will be getting the certificates and i assure you this is a successful program i cannot read so many messages but the most of the messages are related to certificates i have heard dr mc patel's lecture today i have heard he is a very good orator i have heard jb sharma sir he is a top most indian a very famous person in urogynecology he is also going to do a workshop in our mumbai aicog and all of you are welcome so thank you so much i stop your sharing yeah
Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Niranjan. That was extensive, exhaustive, and elaborate. Uh, and of course, your videos were wonderful. I'm sure the young generation is stimulated, definitely. And they will have, you know, uh, insights into the subject, definitely maybe a uh, little improved ability of you know tackling the difficulties so thank you so much and we are happy that you could cover everything here yeah i i, I find my sir dr pk shah here there and i'm really happy yes. that he is there together yeah. nilima and, can you unmute dr sheila mane she is writing that uh, dr sheila mane and there are many of them are here i can yes, see yes. so many familiar faces excellent and videos you? niranjan excellent excellent videos Thank you, madam. And Very we nice. worked together for PPH model. Dr. P. K. Shah, sir, was my professor when I was a registrar, lecturer, associate professor, a very meticulous person and an ethical man. And we have always been taught good things. And I'm really proud that he is sitting here today amongst us. Thank you, sir, for being there. And all of the all professors who are here, I can't see so many names, but I'm sure. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Dr. Niranjan, and thank you all the respected seniors without, I'm, I mean, I'm really short of uh, words also, but short of time as well. Uh, Nilima, can we have the uh, answers for today's... Yeah, uh, Sneha, just one minute yes. as a yes, vice chair. Please, as by as the time president. you go ahead. Yes, yes. Yeah. I think uh, uh, to all the delegates and those who have also attended on first and second day, I really uh, thank you all for joining this course. And I think this was very informative. And I can, uh, from the attendance only, I can make out that how useful it is. I think it will be, uh, the, all the lectures, everything will be uploaded on the website. Yeah, yeah. later. So yes. those who have missed That's it the, can definitely listen because excellent faculty. And uh, like I was listening to Dr. M.C. Patel sir talk, you know, perimortem cesarean section. I think, I think we need all those SFPs everywhere because when you need in an emergency, so like that for every talk, you know, if you have the SOPs, it will really, really uh, help you. And I must congratulate Dr. Sneha Bhuyar. You have proved that, Sneha, that you are a real academician. Uh, excellent program framed by you and by your committee. Uh, Monica is here today. I congratulate all of you. And uh, ICOG is looking forward for more academics. And uh, thank you uh, very much once again. And uh, go on doing your academic work. And I think... Uh, Wishing you all the best for your future endeavor. I think uh, Sneha is also going to contest for the post of vice president uh, this year again. And I think uh, we would like to see her as our vice president uh, uh, as a, such a great academician. So thank you wish all the best. So thank you so much, madam. And uh, uh, we would just go uh, like to go ahead with this answers because the attendees are very keen on knowing the answers. So. Uh, I would just read out the correct answers. Um, what is the ratio of chest compression to rescue breaths? The correct answer is 30 compressions for every two rescue breaths. Uh, second, uh, principles of successful perimortem cesarean are all except to shift the patient immediately to OT because you have to do the cesarean section wherever the patient is. So not to shift in OT, that is the only, uh, I mean, no unnecessary step. Flexion point is situated along the sagittal suture. I'm sure Dr. Jayashree um, Srinivasan has shown you with the diagram, three centimeter in front of the lambda. That is the correct answer, six centimeter from the uh, anterior fontanelle. Uh, Chinon is uh, artificial caput produce in vacuum delivery? That is the correct answer. Uh, which of the following is a complication of vacuum delivery? Of course, the kephalematoma. For creation of chinon, uh, which is the correct and effective negative pressure? So that is 0 0.8 ki kilogram per centimeter square. You have to start from 0 0.2, gradually increase to 0 0.8. Deep transverse arrest is present times is commonly treated by cesarean section. Of course, you have seen the other methods, but Vatans, reverse but Vatans and reverse bridge. Which of the following is not the criteria to deep transverse arrest? That is the premature rupture of membranes. Out of 100 cases of occipital posterior at beginning of labor, 90% will rotate to anterior, only 10% will fail to rotate. Causes of failure of internal rotation include all except a Next. 
special forceps, which was used for rotation of head was the Keelan's rotational forceps, the name itself. So Keelan's forceps. What is the fetal attitude in face presentation? It is the attitude of uh, flexion. Uh, which is a, which of the following is a, it is actually the incomplete flexion. Which of the following is the engaging diameter in phase presentation? It is submento pragmatic. Mento vertical is for brow. So submento pragmatic. In which of the following presentations vaginal delivery is possible in term baby? Mento anterior. Next, following conditions will favor pre phase presentations except. Primary gravida with good tone of abdominal muscles. Next. Vaginal breach delivery is reduced after which trial? The term breach trial. Next. Contraindications for vaginal breach delivery are the flexed uh, contraindications for vaginal breach delivery are all except. So the flex head. Knuckle arms can be delivered by the Lossage manual, that is the correct answer. I'm sure Dr. Charmila has demonstrated it. Uh, forceps used to deliver the after coming head in breech delivery are Piper's forceps. Uh, you have seen how you have to, the, the, mm, uh, uh, the obstetrician has to kneel down. That is what she has shown. So a head to body delivery time for more than how many seconds is to the impaction of the shoulder against symphysis pubis, that is 60 seconds. Fetal complication in shoulder dystocia include all except for fracture scapula. Next, macrobar spanuar is lifting knees to the chest, that is hyperflexion of the thighs over mother's abdomen. Gaskin's manure, it's uh, to keep patients on all four limbs, knee chest position. How, how do you diagnose intrapartum fetal distress? Clinically, meconium stained liquor, uh, that is the correct answer. What is not the effect of fetal distress? The fetal diaphragmatic hernia, but rest are all. Yes. Next. What are the CTG changes for fetal distress? That is the late decelerations. Uh, Contraindications for fetal blood sampling, the face presentation actually because the scalp is not acceptable. Which of the following is contraindication for vacuum? Uh, cervical dilatation of 8 centimeter. I'm sure you, you may have some controversy here. When the vacuum was uh, initially promoted, the advantage was talked about that even it can be you know, applied to the through the incompletely dilated cervix, but nowadays FOXIA, SUG, and all the organizations strictly say that fully dilated, fully effaced cervix, it's only the rotation it can help. 50% of shoulder dystocia causes, uh, cases occur with average baby weight of less than 4 kg. And last, common causes of collapse, massive obstetric hemorrhage. That's all. Uh, we have completed the 30 questions and uh, I'm sure the attendees have tallied their answers as well. Um, ICOG will convey you if you have su submitted all the three days post-test. No worries about the pre-test, but post-test has to be done for all three days and you have to score for more than 50%. Uh, uh, that is what is the criteria for getting the certification. If at all you have any problems, please do communicate with the ICOG office. So with this, I thank all of you. Once again, I thank the FOXI president, Dr. Jaydeep Chang, Secretary General, uh, Madam Madhuri Patel, uh, ICOG chairperson, Dr. Parun Kutradawala, ICOG secretary, Dr. Sarita Bhalerao, uh, the ICOG vice chairperson, Madam Sheila Mane, and ICOG uh, chairperson elect, Dr. Parag Biriwale. I thank all the respected seniors, my mentors, especially Dr. P.K. Shah, sir, Madam Ambuja, uh, Madam Jayashri Srinivasan, uh, Kasturi, and so many of uh, professors, senior teachers who have contributed uh, to this course. And I'm sure just at one phone call, all of them confirmed me uh, and they helped me, uh, you know, to make this program a grand success. I would like to thank all my three coordinators, Dr. Monica Umbadar for the day one, uh, and uh, Dr. Supriya Deshwal for day two, and Dr. Monica Singh, so versatile and very vibrant for day three. Thank you so much once again. 
and I thank you. And uh, of course, Madam has already made an appeal for me, but I would still like to request all of you to vote for me as I'm contesting for Foxy Vice President. Uh, I, I just want sir, to put in a word. Yeah, if I, uh, I, Monica, I don't... Monica, just one thing. If yes. uh, Sir, uh, Dr. Pikesha, sir, if any comments from your side, please. Sir, you're muted, sir. No. Uh, Sneha, I think excellent. Absolutely fantastic. The topics you have selected, the teachers you have selected, something fabulous. And I didn't have time to go through all the three days of uh, lecture series, but today I was there right from four o'clock. And I was thoroughly impressed. <clears throat> so I congratulate you and the whole team of ICOG and your uh, co coordinators, especially Dr. Monica Singh, <clears throat> for this job. I think you've done tremendous good to all the postgraduates. They, have, they must have learned a lot from this series. Continue to do this. Only one, one advice that give time allotment according to the topic. Yes. You cannot have all the topics covered in 15 minutes. Yes. So you decide yes, which yes. topic requires 20 minutes or which topics require 15 minutes and accordingly yes. you give it to them. But Sir. all the very best to you and Wish you success for your vice president's post of Foxy 2024 election. All the best. Thank you very Thank much. You, sir. Thank you. Thank it you. Was a lengthy, I will just take, lengthy I'll talk. just take one minute to ah. share with you that this this course I have just prepared in two days, two days and two nights time. Oh. And I'm so thankful to all of you that for accepting and blessing me. Uh, that is one thing. And secondly, I want to share with all of you that. From this course, we have selected one more master class uh, each month. Uh, ICOG is uh, going to organize, uh, and I'm going to be the convener for this. So, critical care and you know such two more master classes are going to be there. And of course, uh, for those uh, talks, we will be having twenty plus minutes as the time duration. Yeah, that would so be better. We, yes, sir. So All the best. Thanks, sir. Thank, thank you, thank, thank you for being there, Thank you, sir. Madam, I must put in a word that I have never seen someone work so hard as Neha, ma'am. And ma'am, for us, you are already the winner. You are winner of hearts also, ma'am. <laughs> all the best to you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, you dear Monica, and all the best to you also for your elections. Yeah. Thank you. All the best. Thank you, ma'am. See you. Good night. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, Niranjan, sir. Thank you, P.K. Shah, yes. sir. Thank you, Jairani, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Niranjan, ma'am. Thank you, Sheila Mane, ma'am. Thank you so much. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Sneha, ma'am, for the opportunity. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Bye, ma'am. Bye, ma'am.